Welcome everybody to uh, tonight's corporate scrutiny meeting for the 13th of August 2024. Uh, just to let everybody know uh, that this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Apologies, uh, we have an apology from uh, Councillor Arkney and um, the Mayor, Gareth Coates. Do we have any other apologies? Nope, okay. Moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 25th of June, 2024. Um, so we're gonna request, uh, does anybody wanna move that? Uh, Councillor Couchman and a seconder. Councillor Wells, all in favor. Okay, moving on. Um, agenda item three is the declarations of interest. Uh, does the committee have any interest to be declared? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Um, item number Okay, um, Councillor Jay uh, has entered the building. <laughs> um, did you want to, did you have an interest at all that you wanted to declare? I wasn't quite sure if you were here at that precise moment. No, okay. Moving on to the update um, from me. Um, so, there is one um, pertinent one, I suppose, which I think I briefly mentioned on the last meeting which was the recommendations um, back from January, uh, the cabinet meeting on January the 25th, earlier this year. And there were a number of recommendations that were presented. Um, and I'll just go through them um, because this is a, it's not a proper sort of agenda item, it's more of a, a briefing note, should we say. Um, but it's a very um, important issue. So the first recommendation was add the add, adding to the additional resource um, for TBC repairs team, uh, where a particular code is inputted for a property, a manual look back at the history of repairs for that property to be conducted to identify if this damp and or mold has been previous issue at the property or for the tenant at previous property. So the response back um, from officers is a business case has been approved for the creation of a new administrative post for an initial period of 12 months within the housing repairs team. Amongst other duties linked to compliance and complaints will assist in reviewing property data and ident identifying trends in damp and mould at, at property level. Recommendation two um, was that the damp and mould inspection process becomes part of the repairs policy. Um, and the response from officers were a new separate damp and mold policy has been produced that sets out the council's approach to dealing with damp and mold. This is in line with the requ requirements from the housing ombudsman as set, set out in the spotlight reports. This includes the process and time scales regarding inspection and therefore sets out the commitments on the rapid inspection and prioritization of works. The main housing repairs policy will reference a separate damp and mould policy, so the council's approach to damp and mould forms an integral part of the council's overall repairs policy. And then the recommendation three, to ensure that vulnerable residents are prioritised when there are damp and mould issues within the home. And the response was, the new damp and mould policy makes specific reference to addressing reports by vulnerable tenants the policy reflects the requirements set out by government in AWAB's law in terms of timescales for inspections and the production of reports. Um, unless anybody's got any sort of pertinent things to say, I would suggest that if you want to follow up on that, 
um, you're welcome to um, correspond with me outside this meeting. Of course, we might well look for this to come back at some point um, for further review and ascension. So moving on to um, agenda item five and six, there are no responses and no considerations for those two agenda items, five and six. So that gets us to the main part of tonight. Um, now there is um, an agenda item, which was number nine, which was an update on the strategic leaseholder review. Um, we're actually looking and hoping to do that one first. And the reason is we only have the portfolio holder for a certain amount of time tonight. Um, so I would ask, um, and he's given the reasons to me for that. Um, so, but it does require, for this to be moved at the top of the agenda tonight, um, it does require a, a motion to be moved under procedure rule 9.1.3 to change the order of business of the agenda. And we need a mover and seconder. So if it's okay for me to move, and can I have you as a seconder, seconder Councillor Wells? Yes. Um, we do need to vote now, don't we? So is everybody okay with that? If you, if you are, please hold up your hand. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's everyone's in agreement. So yeah, so that moves us on to the leaseholder review. So who wants to start with this one? Is it straight to you, Councillor Clark? Yeah, go for it. Brilliant, so I just wanna start with saying that this is a really important piece of work. Um, over the past few years, um, so proper scrutiny is absolutely welcomed. Um, so I'll start with the executive, stum uh, executive summary. So on the 21st of August 2023, it was agree agreed at full council that the council would undertake a detailed strategic review of leaseholder service charges. This came about following a number of concerns raised by leaseholders and elected members in relation to some of the planned roofing renewals, predominantly in the Jilway area of Tamworth. Consultation letters had been issued under the Section 20 process. The scale and cost of works combined with the sterile legal nature of the consultation letters raised concerns amongst leaseholders and elected members. As such, the proposals were suspended and a strategic review ordered. To assist in delivery of the strategic review, the portfolio holder at the time established the leaseholder working group consisting of elected members and leaseholder representatives. The group working with officers commissioned a consultant through a competitive tendering process to undertake a strategic review of the leaseholder service charge process. This included a view on the legal aspects of the lease, the procurement process and the consultation process, as well as a detailed technical assessment of the roofs that were at the centre of the original challenge by leaseholders. The report produced by Campbell to Kell can be found at Appendix 1. The draft report has been presented to and considered by the leaseholder working group. I'd just like to finish by saying that um, this piece of work has been the culmination of efforts from a lot of stakeholders over the past few years. So I'd just like to give out some thanks to Campbell to Kell for their report, um, the former portfolio holder for his work on it, um, Councillor Coates and former Councillor Chris Cook, uh, and finally the leaseholders and anyone else who was involved in this process. And that's any questions. Um, did the uh, Assistant Director, did you want to say anything or is that okay? Yeah, okay. I was just going to mention one thing actually. Um, this has been a, a phenomenal journey, should we say. Um, there's, there's, there's been clearly a number of stakeholders involved, not the least the, the actual leaseholders themselves. Um, obviously it grabbed my attention a little bit more than a year ago and clearly there were uh, some major concerns to be quite frank about it um, and I, I'm happy where we are now I, I consider this um, in terms of the report from Campbell Tickell a massive success so I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly <laughs> at peace with that I suppose at this particular point that we are where we are at the moment um, however the report does uh, present some concerns to me I would say and I think it's right for me to obviously raise those tonight 
because that's what we're all here for. Um, so I don't want to come across as picky, but the journey does continue and we need to make sure that we have the best interests of both the current uh, grouping of leaseholders and of course going forward for anybody else um, that is in a similar situation. So if you don't mind, uh, Councillor Couchman, if I've just got to, just got to start with a few questions myself. Um, so my first one is both actually for the Assistant uh, Director, um, Paul Weston, and also Councillor Clark, uh, the portfolio holder, of course. Um, so do both of you endorse all recommendations specifically from the campbell Tickell report? Yeah, I mean, I think we broadly agree what Campbell to kind of put forward. I think, you know, in, in terms of the technical assessment, they, they've been out, they've done that tech, technical assessment. I don't think it particularly disagrees entirely with what we'd already assessed. I think, you know, what they've identified is that, you know, repairs could be done rather than replacements. Uh, so happy with that. You know, I think we'd already accepted that the, the letters were very sterile, they were very legal. Uh, they were produced by a solicitor for us, uh, and you know they read like they're produced by a solicitor for us. Uh, so I think, yeah, in general, there's nothing in there that sort of you know that we entirely disagree with on it. I don't think I could, could have put it better myself. Okay, thank you for that. Um, are there any areas of report that you do not endorse? I, I can't think of any. I, I think one of the sort of issues that has been raised, and it's sort of it's in the uh, it's in it's in the body of the report, is around uh, sort of effectively what what this does doing some of the repairing items is defers some of the work. So I think you know it was highlighted by Campbell to Cal that you know effectively yes you could repair now, but in potentially seven seven years plus time you could renew in. So I think that's you know. It, it, what it hasn't done is made the issue go away. It's, you know, it's, it's deferred the, the renewal stage of it. Uh, what I can't comment on is some of the stuff around the finance side because that's not within my sort of, I suppose, area of control in terms of how the financial elements would be dealt with. Uh, so I think you know that that's, that's something we still need to look at. I think sort of colleagues in finance will need support on that in terms of how that's set up for us. Okay, a couple of those questions will sort of lead up to questions, I should, I should say. Um, so if we, if we look at recommendation one, uh, the committee endorses the findings, the findings of the report produced by Campbell Tickell. Now, the report by Campbell Tickell, and I know this seems really pedantic, but we're at this stage now where actually details the key, as I've learned over the last year or so. Um, the Campbell Tickell report produces recommendations, okay? And this report from um, uh, the council um, specifically mentions endorsing the findings of the report. Now the findings are also uh, out, uh, mentioned further down the council report, the, uh, the uh, assistant director report, or executive director report in this case, um, are laid out further down onto that report, okay? So key findings from the campbell Tickell report. Uh, what I have found is that those findings, as laid out in this uh, council report, aren't particular, aren't completely in keeping with what the original recommendations were. So I do have some concerns in that area. Um, so when we talk about the first recommendation in terms of endorsing the findings, I would suggest I would much rather endorse the recommendations. Um, of the report produced by Campbell Tickell. Okay, so my question actually is, can we confirm that these findings are from the original Campbell Tickell report? of the report for the reasons that are set out in our response. 
which are that um, it did recommend that we might offer discounted payments for um, early payment. Um, um, not recommending that we did take that recommendation on board for the reason that it would mean that HRA tenant would be subsidising leaseholder tenant because the, the recharges would not meet the full cost. Sorry, sorry, did you hear me okay? Do you want me to repeat that? Sorry. So our concern was that if we offered discounted payments to leaseholders, then it would not recover the full cost of the work, the proportion of the work that would need to be met from leaseholders, thus causing HRA tenants to subsidise those payments because the, re the discounted element would then fall to um, our, house our own housing tenants to, to meet. Um, there was a second element regarding offering a loan scheme. Um, um, if you cast your mind back to this time last year when um, Cabinet approved a corporate credit policy um, which recommended that payments for goods and services was made um, up front or on receipt of those goods, um, there is no facility for a loan if, if, um, if those um, charges are uh, payments fall to people that feel that they are unable to pay, they can contact us and upon appropriate evidence we can negotiate um, a payment term, um, but we would not support a loan. Um, the um, legislation that was shown in the report, I think it was Appendix, Appendix G, page 138, referred directly to housing associations and not local government. And I would, um, I'm, I'm not sure of the legality that we have to give loans to cover these payments. So we'd have to take legal advice to do that. Um, it would also increase our concern about full payment of those costs and it, the um, potential for increasing bad debts. So for those reasons, we did not support those recommendations in the report. Thank you for that. Um, just coming back on that, actually, uh, I do believe actually the issue of discounts is a bit of a little bit of a dicey area, so I do understand that. Um, I would suggest moving forward the portfolio holder does look at that particular um, part in, in more detail and works with you to try and resolve it. I would suggest trying to get feedback um, from the leaseholder representation as well. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, and, and also I suppose what is pertinent on that particular issue is the question of whether if there is any leaseholders that want to go ahead and with the renewal, should we say, at this particular point, um, because obviously the discount part of it, I suppose, is, is related to that particular option moving forward. So that would just be a, a slight comment back on that. Um, so coming back to recommendation one, um, if I can ask you, uh, Paul Weston, um, are you happy that the findings uh, on this report, from the council report, are of, are of the are the original um, CT report suggestions and recommendations. I think so far as possible, we've tried to summarise what uh, Campbell Tucker have put forward. Obviously, it does include the Campbell Tucker report in it as an appendix, uh, but I think we've tried to cover the main headings off uh, within sort of what they what they put forward. So, which is why it's sort of summarised as you know sort of some key processes in there, so procurement, cons consultation, charging. Uh, so I think covered off at where we can on it, but it will always only be a summary. So um, I'll park that there. I'll sort of come back on that, I suppose, at some point, but uh, I'm happy to bring others in if they wish to do so. Uh, Councillor Couchman, did you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you, Chair. I've got a few questions, but I'll start with the first one, if I may. Reading the... Um, CT report, it seemed to me that communication from the council to leaseholders at the very least has been poor uh, in the past, especially as a lot of these leaseholders were elderly people um, and they may have not expected or thought that they were going to get this type of communication. Um, and I think they've been through a very, very stressful time. 
with not knowing whether they're going to be given next month, they're going to be given a bill for 12,000 or whatever. Um, so I think that what we do need to do, um, and looking at what the report recommends and also the letters, I don't even think the letters are that friendly because we don't see the um, leaflets that they're going to send to explain what a section 20 is and all that. So I would like that to be revised in total and I think you know these leaseholders are owed an apology for that with the way they've been treated so far does anybody want to comment on that you don't have to but uh, if you wish to yeah council clerk I uh, completely agree on the communications and that's something that we are taking away and, and having a look at it it wasn't acceptable and, and we can't expect people to know what the the legalese means like you say section 20 we need to be explaining that out in full and what the implications are so I couldn't agree more Thank you, Councillor Jay, and then I'll come to Councillor Wells. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got a couple of quick things. Um, what, what's the benefit to us keeping these leaseholds? Because it, it's been a lot of hassle for everyone, right? It doesn't, look, doesn't seem like the Council's dealt with it very well. What is the benefit to us keeping it? Why can't we get rid of it off the council's, uh, out of the Council's hands? So the, the, the residents, through some kind of, you know, vehicle they set up that can run it themselves why, why do we need to keep it in, in almost all cases the leasehold flats are amongst uh, council housing flats so we have both council housing tenants and leaseholders in the same block and so far as I'm aware we can't sell uh, the, the freehold interest from underneath uh, a tenant so if it, if it was just leaseholders and it was a leasehold property then that's a different story but where you've got tenants in blocks as well Clearly, there are council housing tenants, and we have certain obligations to council housing tenants. Okay, can I ask my others? Can I go straight? Yeah. Um, Becky mentioned some sort of deviations there where you've uh, you've responded. Where are the council responses in this report that's presented to us tonight? I couldn't see them. Is there a section that's got the council's responses where the council deviating from recommendations? If not, then I think we should defer the whole thing. We should see that. We shouldn't get stuff on the fly in the room. Who wants to respond to that? Yep. I can respond once I can remember my password to get back. This was generally not that you answered that one about finance, but what else is there that we're deviating from? It's a general question. So there is an element on the recovery of charges on page 53 of the pack. Um, so it, it says uh, recovery of the charges is managed through the revenues team in finance. Um, the options have been identified by Campbell to Cal for the recovery of charges. However, deferred payments and loan schemes will increase the risk of non-payment and bad debts and increase the financial burden on the HRA and the housing revenue account. Offering a prompt payment discount may um, also be ultra vires, as it would mean the HRA is in effect subsidising subsidising non HRA costs, and no char no change is proposed to the current position where leaseholders who have the means to pay for their charges on a timely basis do so. And for those who are struggling, arrangements for payment are made in an individual basis, which are affordable for the leaseholder, but also aim to maximise income collection for the council. So are, we, are you confirming on that bench that that's the only deviation? It's the only one. We're not deviating from anything else, from any recommendation. As it stands at the moment, there is, the report's also recommending that we sort of implement a service improvement plan and develop a formal policy on this. So this isn't, a, this isn't the final finished version of anything. Uh, I think you know, it's recognised there's still more work to be done on this. Uh, what this does do is it sort of recommends certain things around uh, taking a test case forward around that development of the leasehold policy uh, and around some of the work that needs to be done and it's a record I suppose what it's really picking out is it's identifying the work that Campbell to Keller have done so far and putting that into a format that sort of puts a response to that so I don't I don't see this as being the final final of anything you know I think that there's still work to be done before anything goes to a cabinet report for full approval I've got two more. If anyone else wants to come in, I'm happy to see them come back. Uh, Councillor Wells, Wells, do you want to come in? Oh. Councillor Jay? 
Two more then. Uh, the direct the the tribunal test case hearing. How do we we've got any idea how long that will take and how much it's going to cost? At the mo at this moment in time, no. I mean, essentially, the the way the tribunal case would work is if we take it to a first tier tribunal as a test case, we initiate it, uh, and we would go to the tribunal with our set out our reasons why we think we should replace a certain roof. Uh, and the test case is determined, does our lease actually allow for renewals? Because it was one of the challenges put forward by leaseholders. Uh, it's very much in the tribunal's hands as to how long that takes. We would have to do a lot of consultation with the, uh, the leaseholders involved in that test case because effectively what they would get is a letter or a notice from the tribunal to say the council is taking a case against you to the tribunal. So obviously we wouldn't want that just landed on someone's doorstep unannounced so we've got to do a lot of work up front with leaseholders on that one so that they understand why it's happening but in terms of the process uh I, I don't know is the honest answer we've only ever been on the other receiving end of it where we've we've sort of had a tribunal case brought against us and we've had to do the responses to it and the certain time frame set around for doing your response to that uh, but the leading time at the other end of it i don't know at the moment and i suppose that's going to depend on a lot on the capacity of the tribunal to do that Thank you. And then my final one, unless I think of something else in the next few minutes. Um, question for the portfolio holder. So if this is in the private sector, let's say this was a bank and customers have been, um, in this case, residents, right, have been put through a period of stress, the bank would consider some kind of goodwill gesture for the hassle they've gone through. Have you considered that for residents? Uh, it's something we can take away and look at the legalities of, because obviously, as we mentioned, we can't use the HRA to, to subsidise. Um, but it's definitely something we can take away and look at because right you are in the private sector there would be a goodwill gesture thank you uh councillor wells did you want to come in with your question and i'll come back to myself if yeah, that's okay th thanks very much um round up quite a lot of things there thank thanks very much for your questioning um councillor smith um i'm not very sure where this report is going to now maybe it shows my inexperience but i'm going to ask the questions um there were a lot of recommendations here and I, I was a bit well I, I don't like a report that starts off with the fact of you know can you recommend can you going to accept everything in it sort of thing that sounds a bit uh, um, forceful if in many ways so is it do I understand that you're going to take this report is there still a way to go and that from this report and other things ongoing effectively you'll be producing a policy or, or, or something to go forward with? I don't know please I'm not sure what the relevance of this report is going forward. If you could just help me out with that, that'd be great. Thank you. Is it okay to ask Councillor Clark to answer that question? Because I think this is this is in your area. So this will go to Cabinet and whatever recommendation scrutiny add on to it, and we will pass that, and then we'll start working towards a policy that we follow for all leaseholder cases. So it's very much setting up the process for the future. So what happened to these leaseholders doesn't happen to any of the leaseholders in the future. And that's where we're looking in terms of going forward with the policy and that will require more work from from scrutiny more involvement with leaseholders and tenants and that's sort of how we see it going forward is involving and putting people at the heart of, of what we're doing because this policy is really important it's just so important that we get it right because it has real world real world impact no no totally agree with you um i spent a long time reading this and trying to understand it well i can see there's a, a lot of work going on it and please don't feel as has been said before i'm trying to be picky I, but it, i feel the importance of it and so i'm trying to try my best to contribute to towards it um but i had to, what i picked out of this was that there was a, there was a lot of detail and some of it i don't still still try and get my head around because of the the stuff that's gone on but i, I picked up three key what I call in my world LFE or lessons for, 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 for from experience effectively is that first of all um, in the past certainly we've been pretty poor at, um, at, at, at talking to stakeholders be they tenants or, or, or leaseholders um, I hear things about leaseholder groups and things like that but I'd like to hear some details about what we're doing to improve that because I think embarking on any sort of uh, endeavor I'll use that word lightly, endeavour, uh, like this in the future, we, we've got to get this right. So we need to understand what, what a stakeholder engagement plan would look like into the future. If, if you could help me with that one first, that would be great. Who wants to answer that? 
Well, I think um, just to point to the first improvement, which is that we, we've um, uh, had from Campbell to Cal a whole new suite of correspondence. Um, so they basically, as experts in this field, have provided us with new correspondence and new letters that are both legally compliant, but also, um, in, in the view of the consultant, are more customer friendly. So we'll be, you know, taking taking those and using those in future because I think one of the the key issue as was pointed out in the report and as we acknowledge was our previous suite of letters were written by a solicitor they sounded like they were written by a solicitor and therefore they didn't have that element of customer care and customer um, friendliness um, associated with them we have other um, other aspects of improving our, our sort of performance in this area one is uh, and again these are identified in the recommendations from Campbell to Cal about providing uh, better quality information to uh, lease potential leaseholders as part of the right to buy process so they have a better opportunity to understand what the likely profile of capital investment will be in, in their property um, ensuring that our website is um, customer friendly and is updated with with relevant information I think in terms of how we are going to engage with leaseholders in the future um, I think that falls into considerations as part of the development of our overall policy as alluded to previously um, one, of, one of the issues for that is, of course, that we want to link this very closely with our, the work that we've got ongoing in terms of our tenant engagement and to make sure that leaseholders are seen as part of that continuum. Um, so that will certainly fall into the development not only of the leaseholder policy, but also development of ongoing policy, uh, work that we're doing in relation to our overall relationship to all of our tenants. Um, so I think that whilst it's not specified in here, or the cabinet report in terms of that work around perhaps a leaseholder working group, uh, a, a further sort of um, leaseholder forum, um, that will form part of that ongoing um, policy development. There is a resource implication with that um, that we need to navigate, um, but I think the commitment from, from the council, as it has been with all of the recommendations from Campbell to Cal, is to, you know, is to implement them unless there is a particular impediment uh, and work, further work that we need to do, um, as there does seem to be in terms of some of the recommendations around um, providing financial support to leaseholders. Um, but we're certainly committed to improving our relationship with leaseholders, along, as I say, with, with our overall um, understanding of and relationship with, with our tenants. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Can I just come back on, on that one specifically? Um, you've talked a lot about letters and things like that, which is great. I know that with legal things and leases we, we've got to have bits of paper etc but uh, again as was told to me in part of the TBC training recently um, you know we've got a reading age of nine years age thereabouts in the community so we just need to be mindful of that you know and there are other ways of engaging with people and maybe one-to-one -one, holding meetings getting people together that sort of stuff and in terms of the ongoing cost you talked about yeah there is but what's this cost so far in terms of trying to pick it up it's far better to, to try and prevent it happening uh, by, by communicating effectively is what I'm trying to say is communication is where we're trying to get to um, so it doesn't happen again. I don't, we, none of us in this room, I think, want this to happen again. This is the whole point is we want it to go forward. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I, I've, I've got two other questions if I might. Sorry, um, is, that, is that okay? Well, if we can come back, if that's yep. okay, because um, before I come to you, Council Councilman, I've just got a couple of questions that were sort of closely um, on on what was recently discussed. Uh, I was just going to come in on. Um, so, just a clarification on recommendation five, which is the committee supports the continuation of the working arrangements with Campbell Campbell Tickell to produce a formal leaseholder policy. Um, which, by the way, I do agree with. Um, does that have to go through the um, through the procurement process, or will it be? No, there's actually some hours left in their existing contract that would allow us to do that. Uh, so we haven't used all the hours up there that we that were allocated in the original procurement. Uh, so we can actually do it within the original procurement exercise. Quick fire, quick fire question then. Um, so when's that likely to finish with Campbell Tickell? We need to agree dates on that because the person who was doing it's only just come back off holiday. Heard that one before. Sorry, uh, can, uh, Rob Barnes. Yeah, I, th I think just to confirm, our ambition is that we have this um, this entire process in terms of um, the policy, the engagement um, done by the end of the financial year. 
um, obviously that there is some work to be done in terms of milestones um, uh, and to develop that into a proper pro project plan but I think our original commitment made back in November of last year was that we would we would finalize all recommendations and implement all recommendations by 1st of April uh, 2025 so that that is our aim to be quite frank that's probably the first time I've heard that in terms of the extension from what from what I can see has been an extension to Campbell Tickell's um, part in this and by the way I don't have anything wrong with that one thing that does uh, lead me to wonder is what is the level of um, support I suppose given that I should imagine you know is, is there a clear answer in terms of number of hours left and how is that going to be distributed over the course of the next year until April 2025? Well, we're in discussions with Campbell to Kel. Our, our understanding at the moment is that they've fed back to us to say that they believe in terms of the, the hours that they currently have um, effectively available, um, already contracted with us, that they will be able to complete the task and to give us a policy that, that um, you know, is fit for purpose within that, um, that uh, envelope. I think what that doesn't cover is the internal resourcing that we will have to, to put to this. And then again, as I say, and again, just to come back on onto the point about resourcing, um, I think we're not as an organisation in a position to say, um, you know, there is a new, a new area of work here, there is a new task to be undertaken, therefore what we need is a new post. Um, I think we've got to look at our priorities and possibly look at our internal resources. Um, there may be better ways for us to organise ourselves um, that means that we can actually sort of cover additional work and cover that additional com um, commitment within existing resources without necessarily having to increase our, our cost envelope. But certainly in terms of that commitment around the policy, um, the feedback from Campbell to Kell is that we have enough in the bank, as it were, for them to complete that, that particular task. The only thing I'd comment on that is, is that we need to be sure that uh, from my point of view, an independent consultant, whether that be Campbell Tickell, is uh, involved in this process over the course of the next year. Um, to be quite honest about, you know, the performance of the council, um, we've obviously seen failings. There has been some major concerns of what has been in the, in the past and what has been produced. So I would, I would. I would just suggest to the portfolio holder to keep an eye on that and to make sure that uh, an independent consultancy is um, is is um, providing um, enough uh, time to uh, to to exert some influence in this in this policy that we we all want to hope for. Um, just another question on uh, the recommendations. Uh, so this time, recommendation eight. Um, the committee endorses the development of the service improvement plan for consideration by cabinet and based on the recommendations set out in the Campbell Tickell. Now, I was quite interested because the um, uh, report by Campbell Tickell doesn't mention by name service improvement plan. So I'm just sort of wondering if that's sort of been taken as a, as a recommendation, sort of where has that come from within the Campbell Tickell report? I don't think it is in the Campbell Tail reports. I think we've recognised that you know there's a lot of recommendations in there. Uh, there's a lot of commentary in there, and I think you know that needs to be managed in a, a proper way. Uh, and I think the the use of a service improvement plan, a documented sort of set of you know responses to the Campbell Tail report of how we're going to respond to that with some timescales attached to it. I think you know will help us to actually manage that process it'll also sort of manage the expectations in terms of the resources we've got available uh, to deliver that service improvement so some of the work obviously is done in terms of things like letter writing and uh, documentation that's been produced by Campbell to Cal obviously they've done some work technical work on a, a set number of properties but clearly you know looking at the report there's other areas in there that are that need addressing, that need that improvement. Uh, and I think sort of having a documented service improvement plan sort of will, will, will enable us to pick up the stuff that's in the Campbell to Cal report, translate that into a set of actions for the team who are going to deliver on the ground. 
Yeah, just to, again to comment back on that, I just think it's very important to separate essentially what are the recommendations and uh, the, the, the ways forward from that uh, angled by the uh, Campbell Tickell consultants and that by the officers of the council. We just need to ensure um, who is uh, who is. Um, basically um, driving this I suppose so when it talks about the service improvement plan that's great and everything but I just want to make sure again it's not something that's a bubble within TBC we need to scope it out with uh, with the with the consultants as well um, just uh, possibly one or two more questions very quickly um, number uh, so why is the why is and by the way I only noticed this literally before um, coming out today so uh, apologies because I would have I would have mentioned it before but why is the surveyors roof survey not attached to the agenda for obviously for members to see no no particular reason I mean obviously it makes reference to it it's you know it was a large document with just lots of technical detail in it so it's just wasn't included in there it's referenced uh, and there's reference to it obviously what what it's what the findings of that survey were uh, but you know it wasn't provided but I mean it can certainly be circulated to to members if members want to see it I mean it's not uh yeah, it does seem a bit odd um, because, of course, the uh, conclusions from the surveyor's roof uh, survey, by the way, was uh, enlightening, should we say. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's bring in some more people. So, Councillor Couchman. Thank you, Chair. Um, you've just mentioned the stock survey, and this is what I was going to go on to. How can we plan for future works if we don't know what needs doing because it seems to me I've come new to this but looking through all the reports and, and reading my background it would seem that it was decided by the council that the roofs needed changing and then well, we'll we'll get the money off the leaseholders and we'll put this in the plan of works but that wasn't done on an up-to-date stock survey now I would hope, I mean, as a homeowner myself, I will regularly check the fabric of my buildings, look at what I need to do, how much is it going to cost, when can I afford to do it. Now, the leaseholders haven't been given that opportunity, they've just been given a bill. Now, I'm not going to go rake over everything again, because that's not fair, we're trying to move forward. But I would like to see, as part of the recommendations, that there is a regular stock survey and that the leaseholders receive a, an, a plan, a, a short-term, medium, long-term plan of what is anticipated will be done to their properties in the first instance, right? And just to, just saying, um, it's all right, the thing keeps going off. Just to say in the recommendation that we're going to do a um, oh, scheduled work or something, isn't good enough. We need to be more specific because I think what's happened here is it's all been too generalised and it hasn't been specific enough. And there are people who, over 400 people in this town, leaseholders, who have sat and worried for the last few years thinking where on earth they're going to find this money. And we should make sure that they know how, when they can plan for and how they can um, get ready so they budget accordingly. Um, and the other thing is, we've got to plan for work for the new leaseholders, this new leasehold system, and getting a proper contract where everything is spelt out for people who are going to take leasehold, leaseholds with us. But we also have, do have a responsibility for the people that are already there, and I think we need a lot more compassion. When you're saying that these letters are more friendly, I don't think they are necessarily friendly. And one of the things I would suggest is that when we are looking, and like Councillor Wells said, when you're looking at giving the information out to people, maybe some officer time could be given, appointments could be made either for the leaseholders to visit us or for us to visit them in the home and explain exactly what it means. Because a lot of people don't understand all this legal jargon and that's the first thing that frightens them. If you say to them, well actually it means this, this and this, there might be, 
you know, oh yeah, I can deal with that, I can deal with that, I know what's going on. But if you just give them a load of legal stuff and say, uh, Bill, whatever, they're, they're not necessarily going to be understanding of it all. They're not corporations and they don't deal in the corporate world. And I think that's where we've let a lot of people down. Does anybody want to come back on that at all? Yeah, so in terms of conditions, stock condition, yeah. We have historically done stock condition surveys every five years. Uh, we're in the process of doing one at the moment. Uh, this time round we're doing a 100% survey, or as close to 100% survey as we can. Historically we've not done a 100% survey, we've used sort of fairly industry standard surveying levels to uh, achieve the level of condition data. Uh, those condition surveys will look at every property. Uh, but they will still provide notional life on uh, components in properties and certainly one of the things that came out of the Campbell to Cal report is actually making that information available to leaseholders uh, further in advance, so in, a, in as much advance as possible. That stock condition data also feeds into the 30-year housing revenue account business plan, so it's, it's important for that purpose as well. Uh, so yeah, you know, that, that, that's sort of happening now. It's also a requirement for the social housing regulator, so you know it's, it's all part of that process. Yeah, and, to know it's well, again, it would be a notional <laughs> program based on notional lives, uh, so so, but it would give an indication as to what that would be. <laughs> in terms of the letters, everything has to be done in writing. We have to do that. There is no choice because that's the legal process. What we have sort of mentioned in there and referenced in there is looking at what the resourcing would look like to do that more hands-on approach because the resource isn't there at the moment to do that so that's one of the considerations that will need to go into that sort of planning uh, and the service de development around what does that look like for us and how would we deliver that thank you um councillor summers did you have your hand up earlier and then i'll come to uh, councillor wells i gave you the look not a hand up I'll just come back on communication because some years ago I remember sitting on scrutiny and it was recommended that the entire council engage in a review of its communications. Some years later here we are sending out letters to leaseholders um, that are full of legal jargon, that are very blunt and completely unnecessary. Now we've been told before that the prescriptive information needs to be on the letters, of course it does but it also needs to be in a nice, easy to explain, friendly, you know, manner on perhaps the first page with the legalese at the back and more glossaries and terms and whatnot. I mean, I advocated at the time for all the council's communication to go through the plain English campaign crystal mark standard. Did it get anywhere? No. Nope. Have we done any reviews across the board of communications? It appears not. Years later, it's still a problem. And that's a massive problem, organisationally, institutionally. Why haven't we got it right yet? What? How hard is it? You know, these are template letters with mail merge fields. You know, it's not like you have to sit there and write every single one out every single time. It's not hard to do. And it wouldn't be hard to get somebody external to the organisation to come and put this to rights, rather than people within the building who don't necessarily see a problem with them just sending them out because it's the easiest thing to do. We need to sort our communications out and now. And I am kind of ashamed for the council that years on, we still haven't got it right. And we need to, as part of recommendations we put forward tonight, deal with that and push again for a corporate-wide look into communications generally with our residents because this is a completely unnecessary situation that could have been avoided yet again. Did anybody want to come back on that? Yep, uh, Councillor Dean. If, if I'm allowed to talk on this, I can't agree more with Councillor Summers that I have a real issue with the way that we deal with people and the way we communicate. As Councillor Wells said, you know, we were told in our um, comms thing that you're looking at a reading age of eight, nine, ten. You've got to at least go some way towards that and make sure that you, people can understand what you're telling them. As you say, the legalese need to be there, but they don't need to be the bit that frightens you. You need to have that narrative so that people can understand first. And then, you know, if it takes a couple of bits more paper, so be it. 
but it's got to be friendly it's got to be something that people can understand and can work with but also that doesn't um stop us from having somebody knock on the door and talk through it because there are also people who can't read at whatever level it is so you've got to make sure that everybody every avenue is covered and we're we're treating our people with respect councillor wells um, thank you. I think most of the points I wanted to make have been made, but I've just, I just reiterate, I think, that data is everything. I think that, that, that something that's been, I think I saw as an, as a, as an aspiration, in fact, it, it ties in, I think, with the corporate business plan. We're talking about being a data-driven organisation. Um, so, you know, having up-to-date inventory of housing stock um, is, is vital. That's your base data, but I think what goes on top of that really is what I describe in my world as either a repair or an intervention strategy as to, to, to those assets, i.e. it's planned as far as possible um, when you need to carry out repairs or indeed when you need to, need to make interventions for, for, for whatever reason. Um, I hear what you're saying, um, but as usual, the devil's in the detail and until we've got those sorts of things in place, uh, uh, we, we, we won't reap the benefit of them both in terms of either delivery or, or, or management of our finances. And, and that's really where I'm coming from. These things cost money uh, and, and they do affect people's lives as has been raised a number of times by a number of people around this thing. And I think it's really important we get that right. Thank you. Uh, did anybody want to come back on that? You don't have to. Okay. Um, just uh, some more uh, stuff that I wanted to mention. Um, Sort of not really necessarily questions, I suppose, but if you want to come in and uh, uh, comment on it, let me know. Um, so page two or page 44, um, under technical assessment, um, it says, this is the council report. So it says, whilst the surveys completed largely agree with the surveys that have been previously Completed. So whilst the surveys completed um, largely agree with the surveys that have been previously completed. So we're saying that these, these surveys from the most recent survey are similar to what was before. And in my view, that is complete rubbish. Um, and it's obvious because the new survey, which by the way, I think is fantastic, literally says that these properties in the main have another 10 years of life uh, on them in terms of the roofs. And also, there is no requirement, um, as indicated by the surveyor, for a replacement of the felt. And that is in stark contrast from the uh, survey or the interpretation from before, which was that the entire roof and the tiles and everything needed to be replaced because the felt needed replacement. So in my view, those are worlds apart. I think the new survey um, was much more thorough. We, of course, went into that survey asking the right questions in the first place, so we got, we got, some, we got more out of it. Um, so I don't like the way that that's phrased in the report, and I just wanted to mention that in, in the TBC report. Um, page 3, um, or page 45 depending on how you're looking at it, uh, under repair versus renewal. Um, so in the TBC report, it says, the technical inspections completed by the surveyors have indicated that for those roofs inspected, the life should be extended for between seven and 10 years with an investment in the region of 5,000 per block, which in turn means 1,250 per flat. And, um, yeah, I, I want to know where that's come from because I've read the Campbell Tickell report and I can't see anywhere that it suggested £5,000. Um, I was personally given a, a figure of what would probably be the case uh, and it was uh, when I was on Cabinet and it was uh, a lot less than that, should I say. For some reason it's gone up to 5000 Um I can't see that in the Campbell Tickell report. Um, so. Uh, 
I want to know where that's come from, and I want to know where the seven to ten years has come from, because the, the survey report also mentions ten years and just ten years, not seven to ten years. So I want to, I want to know where those have come from. So the seven to ten years came from the discussions with Campbell to Cal, and you'll recall from the meeting with uh, Keith from Campbell to Cal, he was talking about re-inspecting around sort of five to seven years with a view that potentially some of those would need to be replaced within seven to ten years. So that's come from those conversations with, with uh, Campbell to Cal's technical person. The £5,000 is an average, I think somewhere in the region of sort of uh, £2,000 a block. I think the most expensive was in the region around about £8,000 a block. Uh, but that's come from just sort of basically taking an overall average of all the roofs that were inspected, the prices that come back in from the contractor, and just dividing it across the total number of blocks. So it's, it is just a, a, a simple mean average across all the blocks. But has that come from any recommendation from Campbell Tickell? The, the, pricing, the pricing element, they've told us what was needed on each block and that's been priced then by the contractors, which was what we were asked to do. And why is that not in the report? set out in the report as an average cost. Okay, so yes, again, um, you, know, I, you know, I'd prefer detail on this. How do we arrive at £5,000 uh, per roof? You know, we're at it again. Uh, we want a breakdown. We want comment from those that have been, um, you know, reporting on that, whether that's the surveyor or Campbell Tickell themselves. So I would suggest the portfolio holder goes away and confirms those uh, values. Um, and comes back at a, a future meeting. Um, just one more for now, just from me. Um, page two or page 44 under consultation process, we have in the TBC report, quote, it was the view of Campbell Tickell that the consultation process meet the met the minimum legal requirements set out in legislation. It was recognised that the letters had been sent out were sterile and written in a very legal manner as opposed to one that was customer friendly and customer focused. So that is true, um, but I would suggest the Campbell Tickell report actually is a little bit more damning. Quote, the notices meet the basic statutory requirements, but they are poorly drafted and confusing in places. For instance, the different stages of the process are shown incorrectly on the notices. So the reason I'm mentioning those is because a little bit um, further at the start of the meeting, I, I mentioned about the findings, I suppose, as one, of as one of the recommendations. And in my view, the findings from this uh, TBC report are not in true alignment to the tone and the understanding of the recommendations from the Campbell Tickell. So I have concerns with that. And I would suggest at this moment in time, I have concerns Unless you can say right now, um, and I sort of asked you this question earlier, and it, I, I wasn't quite sure whether it was answered properly, but unless you can say in recommendation one that the findings are exclusively from the report produced by Campbell Tickell and have no bearing or relevance necessarily to the findings within the section of the TBC report, if you can say that is true, then I'm okay actually supporting that recommendation. So I just want to be absolutely clear on this because I don't think the findings to completely align themselves to the recommendations and suggestions within the Campbell, Campbell Tickell report. Yeah, I mean, the Campbell Tickell report is, a de is attached as an appendix. Uh, so we're not hiding the Campbell Tickell report from anyone. Uh, I think, you know, the, yeah, it's paraphrased. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's paraphrased in terms of uh, what we put in the report to try and pick up the stuff on there, but you know the, the report is in there for all to see, uh, and the recommendation says uh, endorses the findings of the report. So that would be the report that's attached. I think you know the, the commentary around the uh, finance side has already been said that not necessarily accepting 
the recommendation from that, but in terms of the findings, it, the report is attached, and that's what the that's what we're recommending uh, that that report is endorsed. Councillor Wells, can I just ask why is it still a draft report? The um, tickle report is not draft. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, ultimately, that that was the report that we've we've had from them that uh, would go in. I think you know, once once we give them the go ahead, they'd actually prov provide final reports on it. But that would be, as far as we can see, the report that everyone's seen is the report that the scrutiny uh, working group has seen. Uh, so I would see that's been their final final report. Sorry, just just again, it, it seems strange. I mean, I. I write reports for all sorts of people. I never give them a draft. I mean, that's it. That's the report. If it needs updating, it needs updating. We would track the updates and you'd see the updates. I know it sounds like a picky thing, but I just think it's important. Councillor Summers. Yeah, just coming back on what you've said about the recommendations in our own report, there's one thing um, as a committee endorsing the findings of the report produced by Campbell Tickell. And there's another accepting the recommendations and implementing the recommendations in the report, which is not what we're being asked to do in those recommendations. That's quite dangerous, really. They've produced a whole set of recommendations for us to follow, and we're just saying, yeah, we endorse the report. Thanks for the work. But it's not saying we follow what they've asked to do. It's not saying we implement their recommendations that they've come up with in the report. It's very, it gives us a huge amount of wriggle room to get out of everything that they've asked us to do. Yeah, I mean, I would prefer actually if many of these were actually specific. If we're not, if the, if if we're saying at this point there are some concerns around some of these areas, like discounts and, of course, payment plans as well, why not be as specific as possible? And you know, Councillor Jay sort of tried to attack this earlier in the meeting. Why not um, have have the level of detail in this report, Councillor? Can I just quickly add, our recommendations pretty much should be verbatim what they've recommended and we discuss what we leave out or change, modify, and we put the recommendations then forward to Cabinet to approve. Endorsing it isn't enough. Yeah, I, I think just to be clear, I think we're perhaps sort of talking about differences in language and how things are presented, so that, I mean, it's really welcome and useful feedback. Um, obviously, it's you know the purpose of tonight is to um, effectively for scrutiny to give us that feedback and to consider what recommendations you want to make um, to cabinet. Obviously, you know the, this report and I think the question was asked earlier about where are we in the decision making process. Obviously, the next step for this is to uh, take recommendations to cabinet. I mean, I have just had a scan of the recommendations from the Campbell Tickell report. Um, I, looking through those again, just to refresh my mind, I can't see anything in there that, he, that he, we are not accepting as a set of recommendations, with the exception of the item that has actually been raised around those payment terms um, for leaseholders. So I think if we're sort of, if, if the concern is around the difference between findings and recommendations, I think what we are saying is that those recommendations um, are, are, you know, to be implemented. Um, I think the I think some of the conversation tonight has been about the speed of implementation, the approach to implementation, um, and I think some of those were, some of those recommendations will have to be form part of a, a longer term improvement plan. Um, and also, I think just to come back to your your point, Chair, we again one of the recommendations in that report is that we look to be supported in the future by expert advice from uh, from consultants. And I think again, you know, that would be something that we are we are fully on board with, um, with with implementing. That doesn't mean necessarily from a procurement journey that that will always be Campbell to Kell in the future. But certainly, we'll be looking to have that support ongoing, not just in the development of the, of the policy. I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you, Councillor Jay. Yeah, a couple of points. Uh, I agree with Councillor Smith's point earlier about. Um, you know, one their report says ten years, and then I'll say seven to ten. We've got the obviously anecdotal evidence tonight, but it's irrelevant really because it's not in the report, so it should be ten years. Um, I agree with Councillor Summers' point about the 
pushing for sort of this um, gold standard or what did you call it, the, the mark? Crystal mark. Crystal mark across all comms. And I'll probably suggest you formulate a, a recommendation to add that in as well. Um, uh, so I think that is key. Good to hear the leader agrees with that. I'm not sure I'd go to the point of knocking them everyone's doors though, because I know you said some people might not be able to read, but these are intelligent residents who bought properties. So I think, you know, I think we could have to knock everyone's door. Um, I have got a recommendation that I'd like to propose. Um, the portfolio holder said it takes something away, but I'd like to formalise it. Do you want me to do that now? Yeah. Yeah. Please, Please um, say it. Yeah. So. Recommendation that the portfolio holder and officers devise an appropriate goodwill payment using industry standards as a small gesture from this council to these residents in light of the inconvenience and worry caused during this period. I can send that to you. All right. Say it again, yeah? So I recommend that the, policy, uh, the portfolio holder and officers devise an appropriate goodwill payment using industry standards as a small gesture from this council to these residents in light of the inconvenience and worry caused during this period. I want to make it clear, this isn't the recommendation now, this is me talking, it's not compensation, right? Lots of the elements were okay in this report. It's just a small gesture as these residents have been put through the mill throughout this. So rather than just a thank you, I'll take it away, I'd like to formalise it on the floor and put it in the recommendation. So I'm moving that and hope to get it. Seconder, thanks. I'll second. Does anybody want to talk about it? Yeah, Councillor Kerishman. I think it's an excellent idea, except that um, we would need to know how much that payment's going to be. Because I think of everything that we found out tonight, we need to double check everything. Um, so I would say that you can offer a, an ex gratia payment in lieu of um, distress caused, uh, but referred back to us to ensure that it's being done and to the level that we think, because I wouldn't be very happy if I got a five pound cost of voucher. And nor am I expecting the rest of the uh, council taxpayers to you know, send them on a summer cruise. So we've got, I'm sorry I'm being flippant, but we've got to get the balance right. Could, could we just add to that recommendation then? So where we say devise an appropriate goodwill payment and seek approval of this from scrutiny or something like that, just so that it comes back. And that it's not a cost of card. <laughs> May I ask if the Section 151 officer wanted to comment on that at all? Or how does that, how does that align to uh, the finances? I think we just need to take that away and give it consideration. Uh, Councillor Cashman. While we're on recommendations, um, I think that we should ditch recommendation three and recommendation four. Um, because if we've said, as you said earlier, Chair, that the um, roofs have got 10 years in them and therefore don't need repair, why are we putting recommendations in that says we're going to do remedial works and undertake remedial works? Well, remedial works is the works that um, have been suggested by the surveyor that are just the now, the present, basically, that need to be sorted. Um, I'm, so, recommendation three, um, so approves to cabinet, um, that the consultation commences in relation to the remedial works identified in the campbell Tico report. So that's just sorting out those very localised issues. It's not, it's not to do with the whole renewal. Um, so four. Quick point of order. We've had a motion moved and seconded. Do we not vote on that and add it to the recommendations first? Is that the process? I don't know. Just... Yeah, sorry, I thought Councillor Cashman was going to comment on this particular issue. So. <laughs> okay, so all in, all in. Uh, do we need to read out the recommendation? Is okay? Is everybody okay can with just, that? Can you, can you just email me the, the final word in? And I've added in a bit, so we're, everyone's happy with that. Can I just say there's a comment, f sorry, from uh, Becky there a minute ago. We'll, we'll take it away and look at it. This is a recommendation. Obviously, the Cabinet can say no. That's up to them. They can reject it. 
But this isn't to go and look at it. This is to, this is to do it, to devise a payment and do it, bring it back here. It's not to go away and look at it and think about it and maybe, no, this, this is to, to do it. It goes to cabinet, of course. They have ultimate authority and they can say no, but this isn't to think about it. This is to actually devise it and come back. Can I just insert a, a quick question on it before we vote? Because um, I think it's probably the responsibility of me to do this as chair. But I mean, do you as officers have any issues from a legal standpoint in, in that approach? I know uh, Councillor Jay has mentioned, obviously it can be turned down by cabinet, but just wanted to uh, potentially get your views. I said we'd just take that away and just check. I, I, I think it's possible. I just need to, we will, when we bring it back, we'll bring those legalities with it for you. Councillor Summers, did you want to comment on this particular Yeah, Yeah, with, with, with respect, Chair, um, and as you've said, we, we can recommend what we like. I know. Sadly, no. um, we're not a decision-making body here in scrutiny, um, so we can recommend it, and it can be put as a Cabinet report or form part of a Cabinet report, and then Cabinet can decide whether it's feasible for them to accept it or not. So it doesn't really matter um, whether somebody tells us we can't do it or not. If we decide we're doing it and recommended it, we're doing it. So let's go for the vote then. Uh, all in favour of this particular recommendation? Happy with that? Yeah, that's, that's all passed. I'm in favour, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, right, where are we? So, I've, does anybody else have any more questions in regards to this particular agenda item? Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Price. Yeah, just on the recommendations, I have got a bit of an issue with uh, recommendation number eight um, that I'm being asked to endorse, which is, which is bad enough in itself, um, to endorse the development of a service improvement plan for consideration by the Cabinet. Um, but I don't know what the improvement plan is that I'm being asked to endorse yet. Um, will that improvement plan be coming back to committee before it is then sent to cabinet to be approved? Very valid question. Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, if the commi committee wishes it to, then yes, certainly we'd be uh, happy to consult first with the um, scrutiny committee uh, in the development of that. And obviously, as we have done along the way with this particular um, issue, um, have that continued dialogue and, and uh, uh, work with, with yourselves around both the improvement plan and the leaseholder policy. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Price, did you want to come back or? Sorry, I didn't quite hear that, so there you go. Um, in that case, can we change the recommendation to include the word in that that does come back to committee before it, it's referred to Cabinet for approval, please? Yeah, I agree, and it sort of echoes what I, one of my uh, questions from earlier, actually, on the uh, on this um, service improvement plan. Um, Councillor Summers, did you want to comment on this particular issue? Yeah, I mean, as I said before, what, we paid a company to do this. Why aren't we just saying we adopt their recommendations? Well, why 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 are we making our own and putting, like I said wriggle room in there by saying we endorse rather than we adopt their recommendations. We formally recommend the recommendations in the report to Cabinet, maybe add the extra bits that we have in our own report, but what is wrong with the expert advice we've been given? Why did we pay for somebody to come up with recommendations for us to just ride roughshod over them? So are we saying are we going with just dropping the recommendation or are we going to go with something different? Um, did the portfolio holder want to comment on this in terms of the direction of this um, service plan, improvement plan? I think in terms of our report, the Campbell to Cal report is referenced and, in, and encapsulates everything in terms of like it being um, in, the con in the wider context of the council and would have addressed the financial points as well. Um, but it's like, as we've said before, it's no secret. The Campbell to Care report isn't hidden. It's, it's referenced in our report. And so I, I stand by what we've done here. Councillor Jay. Yeah, we've just obviously been just talking offline here. But I mean, that, that would have just been the simplest solution, right? To say it's recommended that this council implements in full recommendations from the Campbell to Care report. Mm. And then we can add, obviously, these, this, this one from tonight. 
Yeah, I, I, I do agree. I do agree. And so does anybody else want to comment on it at all? Or? Uh, basically, to endor endorse the recommendations from the uh, Campbell Tickell report. Well, no, I said that this council uh, that is recommended this council implement in full the recommendations from the Campbell Tickell report. Okay. As a replacement to eight. Pardon? Because I guess we're getting quite similar to recommendation one then at that point, aren't we? If we're not mentioning the service plan as part of that. Did you want to? Did you want to comment or <laughs> looking ahead? Just wanted to comment that we're not implementing them in full, though, are we? With the uh, we're not recommending the implementation of the, the two finance elements. So we would need to take that separately. Okay, let's put that to the back of our minds at the moment and venture on because we've got a lot to get through and we'll come back on this when we come to the recommendations. Um, I've just got um, a couple more questions, I believe. Um, page 45 or page three, proposed next steps, remedial works. Um, the. Uh, council report says this is based on the assumption that remedial works are favoured are the favoured option over renewal. Uh, and by the way, that's the kind of general tone is that we're talking about still renewal. And I was quite, I found that quite strange really because I thought we got over that in terms of renewal. And why are we even bringing it up? Um, so why is it even an option? I mean, ha, you know, have we decided to move on? Are we moving away from renewal, or is it still an option? Um, I'd ask the portfolio holder to confirm that, please. I think that's in there because we're going to see what the the test case says at the the first tier tribunal. Um, but it's there for in terms of resource implications as well to see what our options are, rather than taking everything off the table. But the, it's, it's in there about the remedial works and the repairs and about the favoured option. It's funny you should mention that because um, I've got a question uh, that relates to the first tier tri tribunal. So in the, again, the council report, it talks about a test case, as, you, as you've said. So arrangements should be made to commence a test case through the first tier tribunal. This will test the assumption that roofing and renewal is permitted under the current lease arrangements. This will need careful consideration as legal notices will be served on those leaseholders selected to be part of the test case. There will need to be a consultation in advance of the test case commencing and ongoing communication with those impacted throughout. So who is this test case for? Just want to get clarification. So the, re the discussion with Campbell to Cal was that there was, a, there was a question raised by leaseholders as to whether or not the wording of the lease allows for renewals uh, as opposed to just repair. Uh, and the view was, from our side and from previous test cases, was that if, if, a, if a roof is in sufficient need of extensive repair to the point where it's no longer economically to, to repair, then renew and renewal is the main option for you. So you, you can no longer repair, so it needs renewing. That that was permitted under the lease. That, that was the view. I think what Campbell to Kell had recommended was that we actually take a test case to the tribunal uh, putting that forward as our suggestion that a renewal where a roof was beyond economical repair was permitted under the terms of the lease uh, to get their view on it. So that, that was where that's come from. And that's come directly from Campbell to Cal's uh, commentary to us. Well, it's funny you should mention that because if I go to the report by Campbell to Cal, their commentary is where future proof renewals are required, we recommend that TBC makes an application for a determination at the first tier tribunal. tribunal. That, is a reasonable, that it is a reasonable to renew the roof given the cost of historic patch repairs, cost of scaff scaffolding and evidence from the independent surveyors. So there's no indication from, and maybe you can just clear this up, are we talking about the current leaseholders in this whole issue 
or are we talking about future situations of renewal? But because in terms of the current leaseholders, surely we've moved away from any potential for renewing their roofs at this point, based on the surveyor report. For the, for the particular roofs that were inspected, yes. But that doesn't mean to say that there won't be others that would need renewal. And this is to test that case for the future. So essentially, leases that are current remain current. But this is basically sort of saying, at some point, there will be roofs that will need replacing because they are beyond any economical repair. And the view was to take a test case through to just determine, is that even possible? And I think that's important for us to understand as early as possible, because if the uh, tribunal says no, then that obviously impacts on uh, our budgets going forward. So I think it is important to understand exactly, you know, is our interpretation of the lease correct? I know we've been through a tribunal before, but is it correct? And the test case was there to actually say, is the agreement that renewal is permitted under the terms of the lease where a roof is deemed to be no longer economically viable to replace. So it doesn't necessarily impact directly on these because the determination has been that they can be repaired. But what it does do is it sets the scene for the future. So when those roofs do come up that do need replacing, we actually already have that sort of uh, determination by the first tier tribunal that we, we can charge for renewal. Uh, because if their view is that we can't, then there's not really much point in consulting on renewal if the tribunal's already said you can't do it. It also needs something that we need to factor into our long-term business planning uh, because suddenly where we, think we, where we think we can charge for these and would be looking to recover a set amount from leaseholders based on the rules that were replaced, if the tribunal at this stage says, no, you can't do that, then that obviously impacts on our future budgeting. So that, that's why the view was to take that case forward now. I just want to be clear, who is this tested on? Is it one of the number of leaseholders that have been involved in this review? To be determined, uh, this is why it needs to be sort of, there needs to be some detailed consultation up front as to who we actually consult with, and they need to understand that it is being consulted on as a test case, as opposed to uh, actually planning to do the works on that property. So, you know, there's going to have to be a lot of work done up front to make sure that they understand that that's the case. Uh, and that we're not saying, yes, we're doing the works, that it is purely done as a test case. Okay, I would just come back on that and say that I don't think it should involve the current leaseholders that have been engaged in this as part of this review. I think it should be on a future um, renewal situation. Um, I just would worry about the stress and, and worry. Um, I know that we've talked about that we're talking about, you know, remedial works and not renewal, but I would just tread very carefully with that. So I, I would ask that the portfolio holder um, picks that up. Councillor Sun, oh, Councillor Couchman, sorry. Looking at these test cases um, that they want to put in, there's already been at least eight in London where cases have gone to court and mostly about roofs and leaseholders. And it seems that in each one, the leaseholders have either prevailed or partially prevailed. So I'm wondering what is the purpose and you know, thinking about additional costs of this. Because as you've said, is it for the new leases or the old leases, the existing leases? I mean, have we got a copy of the existing lease so that we can see what they're talking about? Um, I'm, and I'm just wondering whether or not we're going to spend more money after bad, really. Does anybody want to come back on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, just to say that the, the, the recommendation comes from Campbell to Kell, who have reviewed our lease, and this is their recommendation based on their knowledge of our lease. Other cases may be different, other leases may be different, but there isn't a clear case that we can, we can look at and say, um, you know, there is case law to show that our lease doesn't support that renewal. Uh, and again, that's the reason for the suggestion around the, um, the, the, uh, the, the sort of test case going forward. I think the, you know, just to say, the council doesn't have the option of saying, well, actually, we, we feel that in actual fact, we should simply not charge for renewals because the council, in addition to a, a number of other responsibilities, does have a, a fiscal duty um, to ensure that it, covers, it recovers revenue where that's legally correct to do so and possible. So again, the recommendation 
uh, for, is from, from Campbell to Kell, from the report, um, and it, it supports their view that this actually does need testing. So they're not in a position to say to us, no, your lease does not support um, renewal. They're recommending that we need to test that through, that, through this mechanism. Um, and I think, as I say, just to, to sort of recap, that you know there may be cases elsewhere, but that doesn't mean that there is an established um, uh, example of case law that we can simply say, well, our lease is exactly the same as that. Circumstances are the same, and therefore we can be assured that this is not recoverable. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Summers. Yeah, I, I I understand the need for a precedent to be set in a test case. It's um, and as you say, our lease might not quite meet the same legal standard, might not have the same wording exactly as one of the ones that has already prece preceded down in London. My concern, really, about uh, a tribunal, um, as we've alluded to before, is a letter landing on somebody's doorstep saying, we're taking you to a tribunal. And the publicity that that would bring us, um, it's a very difficult situation especially since that those people who were involved in the tribunal will presumably need legal representation and who's paying for that you know are we uh, are we going to expect the tenants to uh, to pay for legal representation at this tribunal um, for us to prove a point it's a hot potato and I wouldn't like to be the person making this decision or picking the people who are going to be put through this Anybody want to come back on that? No. Anybody else got any more questions? I've got a few more, but uh, just happy to bring anybody in. No, okay. Um, so just clarification, actually. Page 45 or page 3, proposed next steps, refers to letters, uh, which has been alluded to before. Um, so that information in Appendix 2... Um, which, by the way, when you go into it, it says Appendix A, so that's slightly confusing. So that document with all those templates in, which are supposed to be friendlier, is that wholly, has that wholly been produced by Campbell Tickell? That suite of documents is what uh, Campbell Tickell have sent over to us, yeah. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to check that. Um, so page 46 or page 4, proposed next steps, management structure. Um, it says in the council report, um, a review of the resources allocated to the management of leaseholders and leasehold service charges will be needed if the council is to fac facilitate greater levels of engagement with leaseholders in future. It is likely there will be from time to time be a need to buy, to, to a buy in some additional consultancy support to review and update policies and procedures uh, as legislation around leaseholder charges. Um, can I just talk about some of the internals within TBC? Is there any, and maybe Rob Barnes wants to pick up on this, you know, is there any substantial changes that have happened in the last year or so that have sort of addressed some of those shortfalls that we've seen? Sorry, Chair, in relation to um, organisational structure yeah. and resources allocated to leaseholder? The structure around the, the engagement of asset policy. Right. There, there's nothing relating specifically to leaseholders in terms of changes to resourcing. Um, that's one of the areas that we will look at as part of our improvement plan. Um, and we, we're essentially waiting, have waited for the outcome of the review uh, in order to sort of take that forward. What we have done through the process of implementing the regulatory social housing program requirements is um, implemented a number of improvements and are in the process of implementing further improvements in relation to our over, overall engagement with tenants um, and that will be mirrored uh, in terms of the work that we do with leaseholders. So I would say in terms of that there has been no changes to structure or resourcing around leaseholders per se and that's partly been driven by the fact that obviously we have not issued any further consultation uh, or Section 20 notices, um, but there has been groundwork done in relation to our overall programme of engagement with our customers. Thank 
Chair. Thank you. Um, nearly there. Uh, page 46 or page 4. Options considered. Uh, you've got immediate renewal versus remedial works. Um, yeah, kind of, I, I've got to be honest about this, uh, which is kind of, it, it's just, it's so annoying because you look at the first one, you've got complete all works as planned and recover costs in full from leaseholders. Um, I realise options considered as part of the process, it's in the constitution or whatever, although there's debate about how that's structured. Um, but you know, when you've got a column of advantages on the completion of works as planned and recover full costs from leaseholders, so what we're saying is replace the, the, the ruse and, and ask the leaseholders to pay those full costs, you've got more advantages than risks. And being that we've gone through, uh, you know, in the last year we've gone through all of this, and clearly we've recognised some serious issues here. You know, why are we talking about more advantages than risks at this point? There's no advantages with this, um, in my view. It just, it just seems, you know, to be frank, it seems quite offensive. So I wouldn't have structured it like that, personally. Um, I think we've got to move on and, um, and consider the options on the positive path that we're, we're now on in terms of dealing with these remedial works. And um, you know, in terms of the actual renewal side of it, you know, I want to move away from that because I think we can all agree um, we're not going to go down that route at this current state, or we would recommend not to go down that current state. So I don't want to be causing any more stress uh, for those uh, leaseholders as part of this, uh, as part of this review. Um, so that's just a, a bit of a comment there. And that sort of, um, um, repeats itself, I suppose, through a lot of the options um, on pages 46 and 47 and, and so on as well. Um, okay, um, is there any more questions in regards to this agenda item at this particular stage before we move on to the recommendations of what we're going to do? Okay, cool. So, by the way, Councillor Jay, you mentioned a recommendation, potential recommendation, uh, I can't remember if it was you or Councillor Summers, around the crystal mark. Did you want to make that as a recommendation, as part of these recommendations? Yes, since it was recommended many years ago. Um, let's do it again. And how would you like to get that worded? Um, I'd like to say it, follow up and find out what happened to the original one, but let's start afresh, shall we? <laughs> you reckon? Well, um, I would uh, consider the adoption of a plain English, plain English campaign crystal mark across the board on all of TBC's communications to customers, residents. Um, or something similarly suitable. It's not just relating to this, it's obviously More across the board. Well, you know, an outbound communications review. Essentially, we had Andrew Barrett and um, Annika in the room with us at the time committing to doing this. That was years ago, and it, it, it never did happen, really. Uh, obviously, otherwise, we wouldn't be sat here talking about this tonight. So, um, yeah, um, so recommend that we um, adopt, um, find out what happened to the original uh, communications review and look to adopt a, uh, a formal uh, standard for communication such as the Plain English Campaign Crystal Mark Standard. Is that all right? Councillor Jay. Happy to second that. Let's all vote on that particular recommendation. Um, is everybody in favour of that, please? Yeah. Is everyone? <laughs> and that's me as well. So we're at a bit of a crossroads in terms of what we were talking about. Um, well, the first tackled a slightly easier one, I suppose. Uh, as Councillor Price mentioned, we sort of can't really 
uh, agree with um, endorsing the development of the service improvement plan because we don't really know what it is. Um, so are we scrapping that one? I couldn't remember where we were or were we rewording it. Not move it, just yeah. not move yeah. it. If no one wants to yeah. move it, someone else might want it. So we're just basically not moving that one. And then we'll come back to the one where we were talking about do we endorse the recommendations of the CT report? Um, and obviously there's concerns on that in terms of what that means. Does anybody want to comment, Councillor Jay? Rather than having the sort of big debate back and forth on that one, which might be more controversial, could we just put recommend that? Well, in fact, not recommend, but can we just, it's already in the minutes that this report is going to get reviewed with the feedback from tonight before it goes to Cabinet. So does that not cover that? that the recommendations can be tweaked at that point, can't they? Taking them on board our feedback. Yeah, well, it's sort of what they were saying, really, which is take it away, basically, um, and come back. That that's fine. Then we can we can leave, we can have it as that as basically we're going to come come back on the next one, Councillor Jay. Could we just? As we're t it's just easier if we just change it. Number eight. Can we just change it? If, if this covers your point, Ben. Instead of the committee endorsing, can we just have it already says it's up. It's recommended that this council develops a service improvement plan, and then would that cover it? Yeah, based on the. Yeah. The recommendation. There's an amendment, so we can not. Yeah. Open did you not? Oh, I thought we did. Sorry. Let me go. Okay. Apologies. Let me just go back to Council of Summers. Just to just to clad the waters a bit. Um, no, the um, obviously we're we're not making a decision, but can we can we perhaps can oh, I've forgotten. Bring it back up again. Um, if we say that um, in the first recommendation that we um, I can't get my technology to work, that we get the um, it, rather than we say we endorse the report, we, we um, strongly urge cabinet to adopt the recommendations of the report. The findings and adopt the recommendations of the uh, Campbell Tickell report rather than just endorse them because ultimately they're making the decision. Yes, um, we, we um, I mean, obviously, um, because Cabinet can pick whether they want to um, incorporate the financial recommendations, um, to be quite honest, but uh, strongly consider adopting the recommendations of the report produced by Campbell Tickell. Got a seconder for that one. Well, Council Wells just got in there as a seconder. All right. yeah. uh, let's all vote. All in favour? Yep, that's passed. So at this point, let's just go through the rest. Um, two, um, we're okay with. Any objections on that one? Can we move the rest on block if we're happy with them? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so number two talks about section 20 notices produced by Campbell Tickell and approves submitting them to the cabinet um, for consideration for use in future consultations. So it says consideration on that one. Um, three, approves recommending to cabinet the consultation commences in relation to the remedial works identified in the Campbell Tickell report. Um, I'm okay with that one, but I would suggest um, that the portfolio holder and officers look at the costings on that in terms of the remedial works. Mm. 
So I, yep, okay, so that's that one. No objections on three, we're okay with that one. And four, so recommends the cabinet the approach to undertaking remedial works as opposed to full roof, full roofing renewals. So we definitely um, are happy with that one. It's very similar to three, to be honest, but it's identifying that we're opposed to full roofing renewals, which is why it was all the funny, it, which is why it was strange, why it was sort of deemed a sort of potential within the report itself. Um, but anyway, and then five supports the continuation of the working arrangements with Campbell, Campbell Tickell to produce a formal leaseholder policy. Yes, agree with that. No objections, thank you. Committee supports the instruction of legal services to commence amendments to future leases to include for the management charge and to clarify the position in relation to major works and renewals with any amendments to be approved by cabinet before implementation. Any problems with that? I'm okay with that. <coughs> and um, so we're gonna move all of these on block if that's yep, okay, that's yeah. Fine, yeah. And seven, committee endorses a recommendation to cabinet that the council takes a sample case to the first tier tribunal to test once and for all the assumptions around roof renewals being allowed for under the terms of the lease. Well, this is where I have a concern, which I've obviously already identified. Um, I think at this point, I would personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't approve that because, um, you know, I'm not convinced we're not, I don't want to cause any concern or stress on the current leaseholders. Like you said, letters on the door. Um, so I would, I would personally, I'd, I'd vote against that one. Um, and I would ask that, you know, and this doesn't need to be an, a sort of an amendment that, you know, it comes back at some point. I'm sure there's, there's enough time uh, to do that at a, a future meeting. Um, so do we, do we vote on that particular if, seven? If no one wants to endorse it. No does does anybody down. endorse number seven, Councillor Jack? I think it's easy enough to tweak again. You know, if you if you read it as it is there, comma, uh, providing this is done in uh, in liaison with residents and there is no legal no legal bills to be paid by the residents, you could amend it like that. That could that ticks off the concerns we had earlier. Yeah, but does that talk about who we're actually asking to test that with? Councillor Summers. Well, well we could specifically say we exclude anybody who's currently involved in this situation as yeah. now, yeah. Um, and <laughs> seek volunteers. Councillor Wells. No, no, sorry, I, I, I understand your point, um, Councillor Summers, and I see some pitfalls, but I don't have a crystal ball to understand all of the pitfalls. So I would suggest that a proper um, proposal is brought back to scrutiny so we can understand it in its entirety rather than give any sort of uh, um, um, way forward if that makes sense that's my proposal probably say i'm more aligned to that persuasion at the moment i know we can t tweak it but i just i'd rather it just comes back and we're a lot more clear about where we're pointing that to um, so unless anybody actually wants to vote in favour, um, say now. If not, we'll we'll leave that one. Um, and I think that's where we are. That's where we are now, isn't it? Um, Is moving it? eight, so I've got two, three, four, five, six, and eight. Um, he, you, he tweeted the um, number eight. Um, we we spoke about that one at the beginning. All oh, right, you just need a vote, is it? Well, You're okay I don't know with how it. We're tweaking it. Sorry. Um, it was to consider and, and bring it back, wasn't it? Is that right? It was, it was so it's already got it's recommended at the top, right? Yeah. Now this council develops a and then a service improvement plan. Just leave the rest as it is. This, this council develops a service. And this comes and this comes to scrutiny before Kevin. <laughs> Um, I think we've got a mover and a seconder already for that one, haven't we? You moved, was it, did you move it, Councillor Chair? We haven't. I'm happy to move it, though. And Councillor Price to second. And all in favour? Yeah, that's everyone. So 
So is that for all the other six as well? No, that was just specifically for the tweak on uh, recommendation eight. Okay. Now we're going to move the rest on block. When I say rest, just to clarify that one six. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Is that right? Who wants to move it? Council. Sorry, Council Wells. Oh, you need to put your microphone on. Sorry, please, Mr. Fair Chair, could you just recap the amendments to those for me, just please? For, just very briefly, which ones have changed? The rest of them are not amended. Oh, you want the clarification of what has already been amended? Because we've all... one to six are unamended. It's, we're voting on them unamended. Okay. It's two to six. To six. <laughs> <laughs> two to six we're leaving as. We've amended one, we've amended eight, and we voted on those, and they've passed as amended recommendations. We've got two extra recommendations around the goodwill payment and the claiming this. Okay, let's just deal with two to six. Yeah. Who's moving it? Councillor J and second is Councillor Price. All in favour? Yeah, all in favour. <laughs> Um, and the two extra, so are you happy with those? Yeah, we, yeah. We, oh, we oh, oh, yeah, we voted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got yeah, those yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, okay. Thanks for that. Um, anybody that's involved in this leaseholder agenda item and wants to go and not um, in anything else, then uh, uh, be free. Okay, moving on to agenda item seven, which is the quarter one performance report. And uh, would Councillor Dean like to start this one off? Thank you, Chair. Um, so item seven is the quarter one 24-25 performance report. And the recommendation before you is, it is recommended that the Corporate Scrutiny Committee endorse the content of this report for consideration by cabinet i would say for those of you who've gone through these reports quite a few times this report will look very different because we've tried to make it a bit more user friendly in the vein of the work that we've been doing all day so um we are open to questions can i just say before i pass over and for questions Thank you very much for what's just gone on, because once again, that is scrutiny at its best. The questions were there, things were challenged, and that's what we should be doing for the people at Tamworth. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Dean, and the report. Um, I was just going to mention, uh, great to see 12,000 in attendance for the St George's Day. <coughs> I thought that was quite a lot. Um, I've just got a question on um, further on on I think the highlights on the first page. Um, it talks about ticket prices at 21k. Um, is there a, is that being tracked in terms of where we are now, where it has been, and where it isn't protect, uh, potentially going to be in the future as well? Thank you, Chair. Yes, it is being tracked. This is the tickets that have been sold through the um, Tourist Info Tamworth Information Centre by the customer service team. So they've been doing, um, been had some training in some upskilling techniques, and that's why upselling techniques, and that's why. So yeah, it's really good news. Just a couple more questions, quick fire questions. Um, Castle Bridge Works um, again mentioned at the beginning of the report. Um, can we confirm the fireworks will not be cancelled? Uh, Chair, yes, we can confirm that. That has been programmed so that it won't interfere with the um, fireworks display. And also, page 21 uh, talks about, this is in regards to the assembly rooms, the performers are costing more than budget. Um, that's on page 21. 
performers are costing more than what was anticipated on budget so far this 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 year financial year i just wanted to know why that was Uh, unless colleagues are able to answer that, um, I'm afraid I don't have that information, so we'll have to take that question away and uh, feed back to the committee at a later date. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Does anybody else have any more questions? Councillor Jay, and then I've got Councillor Catchman. So not, not much to say on the performance in general. Obviously, it's, it's good performance, continues to be good performance, which is, uh, which is good. Um, there was a highlight on there, 40 press releases in the quarter. That seems lower than in the past. So can Councillor Dean just um, confirm and agree with me that communications are going to continue to get the same level of priority that they had before? Thank you for that question, Councillor Jay. I think I've made it quite clear over the last 12 months that communications is one of the things I'm really passionate about. I'm having regular meetings with our um, head of comms and I'm sure you will have seen over the last couple of weeks with what's been going on, how much comms have gone out. We're really passionate about it. One of the things this group has, has said is we must keep communicating with um, the public. We must let them know what's going on. So yes, if, if that has fallen, I will be asking the question why and what we can do to amend it. Councillor Cashman. Thank you. Two points. Um, there was a shortfall in assembly room tickets. So I was wondering who actually books the acts? You know, who makes those decisions? And are all the, how many, what percentage of the shows are sold out? And then how do we feed that back? And then secondly, the ICT audio visual technology in the town hall. Um, I want to know why we're still here, really, because. Marmion House is far more convenient, it's disabled friendly, it's parking friendly and it's public friendly because more we can get more members of the public in who want to come and see the meetings. Um, and I just think that, you know, in the winter when you have to come over here and heat this building at additional costs and also you tra you're travelling, you know, extra staff all over all the time. It, it's not, not just for my personal convenience but for everybody and I just wondered why we're still going to do that. I think I might get an answer. Thank you. I was just going to quickly and say that um, in terms of moving over to Marmion House, that will be something that will be on the next committee. So obviously we'll be talking about that. Uh, but uh, does anybody else want to comment? Thank you, Chair. Um, there will be a report going to Cabinet on the 16th of September, but we'll be coming before this committee on the 5th of September. It's going on the forward plan tomorrow, and it will consider both the reopening of Marmion House and also um, the moving of committee meetings to Marmion House. And on the separate note, with regard to who books the acts at the assembly rooms, our uh, theatre and artistic um, manager does that in conjunction with his team, and they do monitor um, sales and look at um, past trends for um, ticket sales and what kinds of acts are, are liked here. Um, but I do know that um, this is something that Hannah Peters, assistant director, is looking into and um, taking stock of the shows that we've got and had in the past, and then making will make some recommendations for improvements. Thank you. Any more questions, Councillor Summers? Yeah, it's always one to, uh, it's always a depressing read when you look at how many uh, council tenants are on universal credit and in rent arrears and it's 68.9%. That's not a success story. That's, um, that's terrible. And it, it's, there seems to be a disparity with the percentage of council tax payers on universal credit and in arrears with council tax payments because that's considerably lower at 6.9%. You'd expect them to be pretty much the same. So, I mean, what are we continuing to do to get the uh, rent arrears down in particular? Because, you know, that's that's a lot of people um, who are council tenants who, who just are struggling and can't pay their rent for whatever reason. And, you know, if they're on universal credit, you'd think that would be taken care of so it's um it's a lot and that's our one of our biggest problems at the moment i i think anybody want to come back yeah. mm -hmm. 
Well, I was going to say, uh, could you refer me to, to which page that information is on? Um, that doesn't sound right in terms of the numbers. Page 44. It was, uh, you know, 43.7% in quarter four of 2023-24. Um, we were already in quarter one. We've had a, a massive jump. It's on the supplementary just, report. Yep, if I could just come back on that. Um, you'll notice it was a similar percentage quarter one of 23-24. Um, and the reason it drops in quarter four is that tenants make use of the, two, the, the, the free rent weeks at the end of the financial year to catch up on their payments. Um, I think this is one of the reasons that members requested the additional information on universal credit because previously there would have been on housing benefit and that housing benefit payment would have come directly to uh, the council to pay that those rent that, that rent um, but now with the universal credit it goes directly to to um, to our the people that are in our properties um, and then they're prioritising it with the cost of living, I would presume, on, on other items above the, you know, food and clothing above the rent. And that's one of the impacts of universal credit on the council. So we do have a mechanism for those with, um, for council tax to reduce the amount that they pay or offer them a significant reduction, but we don't have that on the housing rents. So, because we don't have that legal, ability to do that and we do which we do on the council tax which may be uh, why you have the, the disparity between the housing rents and the council tax payments just to pick yeah, up that makes sense. I mean, just to pick up on your second point question around what do we do to support tenants so obviously we do have um we, we do seek to support tenants through our own officer um, team who uh, will take early, make early contact with any tenant falling into rent arrears, will seek to make a reasonable agreement for them to, uh, to, to, to make a payment and to recover from that arrear position. Um, we do have other uh, facilities such as our hardship fund uh, where we will actually provide direct support where there is a, um, a, particular, as a particular aspects of hardship. We have a, a referral arrangement with the Tamworth Advice Centre, so we're able to um, refer people for independent um, uh, money advice and um, benefit maximisation advice. Um, so there's, there's a range of measures that we do put in place, and obviously what we do seek to do at all times is to ensure that... Um, whatever the position in terms of rent arrears, that that doesn't progress and turn into any position where we're taking the ultimate sanction of uh, eviction. Um, so there is a range of support provided. Um, thank you, Chair. If, if I may just come back on the information presented to me, Chair. So it, it's rather depressing then to note that um, where we once had um, housing benefit paid directly to the council to, to cover rent, now that the money's going towards people directly uh, into their accounts, they're, they're not prioritising prioritizing paying their rents. I, I'm, I'm minded to recall a campaign we ran on the back of buses, I believe, prioritise your rent over Christmas, um, keep the roof over your head, um, and perhaps we need to, to do more of that. But I also understand and recognise that we do have people who perhaps are feeling the squeeze and are spending the money for rent on on other things which is also depressing to hear but um, I do think um, ed education on this is, is important I think the fact that we, we seem to have dropped in those particular campaigns that we pushed out make sure you're keeping the roof over your head first you know it, it pushes the point to those who perhaps might think okay I might just spend that money on something else at the moment you know, um, it, it's a, it is a difficult one with cost of living crisis at the moment, but we, we perhaps could um, could look to, to bring back those um, kind of more educational 
messages to people and um, and say, you know, prioritise your rent, pay that first and, and definitely push the support that we have available because a, a lot of these discretionary payments and funds that we have, people don't necessarily know they exist. Um, there's, there's still a mystery to people uh, or they don't know that they exist. You know, if they don't know they exist in the first place, how can they access them? Okay, uh, Councillor Couchman. Do we know how many, what percentage of those tenants are four weeks in arrears or more? Because you, don't we find with universal credit, it's paid four weekly in arrears, so people might automatically be in arrears with their council rent because they've, they haven't got the money to pay it. Whereas if they're in substantially more arrears, then you could understand what Councillor Summers was saying. You know, you need to prioritise. But if the system is that you're already or always going to be four weeks in arrears, do we are we aware of that? Councillor Dean. Uh... Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I think I'd just like to say I've, I looked at this and that those figures jumped out, the, the difference between the rent arrears and the council tax arrears. Some of it has been answered, but I think we need a lot more narrative behind who, you know, what the reasons are for those, what is being done. And I would welcome uh, some more information from the officers on what we're doing, how, how we've got there, if the, that element that Councillor Couchman has just spoken about is skewing the figures. It may well be that it's that, but I think we need some more narrative behind this. Uh, Rob Barnes. Yeah, just, just to say, I don't have those figures to hand. That is something that we do, is available to us in terms of that data. Um, and obviously, I think one of the things that we do seek to do is to identify, um, you know, as I say, that, that early intervention and early contact with people. And you're quite right, at times that is, that is unfortunately about payment um, of universal credit. But we can certainly provide that bit of data around what, we, what we've got in terms of those who are four weeks in arrears, uh, under four weeks in arrears, and those who are sort of long-term arrears. Um, so we, we'd be happy to provide that back to the uh, committee. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any more questions? Councillor Wells. It's just an observation and a custom as I am. It sounds like I'm reading a, doing a breastman's speech, but I'm not. Um, I'm kind of custom as I am to reading this report. There are two figures that jumped out to me, is that the number of food bank vouchers issued is, has nearly doubled um, in this period. And also, um, to pick up on your point, uh, Councillor Summers, um, I think there's a figure I picked up somewhere. It talks about the uh, number of people on universal credit as a, as, a, as, a, as a number. That percent, I did a quick number on that, seemed to have gone up 16% since 2022-23, uh, 20, something like that. I can't find the bit in the report at the moment, but I think, I think, I think we've all identified there's an issue there. And I, I think there's a, a wider piece of work to go away and, and see what we can do. Um, that's all I would say. If I can come back on that, the increase in the number of, of claimants for universal credit is due to the transfer over from other benefits. So it's not it's not necessarily we have more people on benefits, it's just they're on universal credit, perhaps instead of housing benefit or other benefits. And I, I think the um, council tax reduction scheme does, if somebody's on universal credit alone, they, then they will get significant, I think it's something 25% council tax have to pay. I'll check that and come back to you. But um, so that's why those arrears are so much smaller because if families are on universal credit, they will get a significant reduction in the council tax that they have to pay. Okay, if we're okay with um, questions and comment, we'll move to the recommendations, which of course is to endorse the content of this report for consideration by, cam uh, by Cabinet. Does anybody want to um, move that? Yeah, Councillor Wells, second. Uh, Councillor Couchman, all in favour? Okay, that's all passed. Thanks uh, for that. Uh, if there is anybody here in relation to that, that isn't in relation to anything else going forward, you are free to go. Um, I've lost track of who's here for what. Um, <laughs> so yeah, moving on to agenda item 
8, which is the vision and corporate plan update. And we, of course, got um, uh, Carol Dean, of course, and um, Christy Timms, which is who have patiently been waiting there for <laughs> two hours. Um, so if you want to uh, yeah, go forward. Thank you. Um, so this is the vision and corporate plan update. And the purpose is to advise members of the develop developing vision and corporate plan and update progress from the ongoing program of consultation. Um, as you will see from the papers that you've got before you, there's quite a lot of consultation that's gone on. You've got the outcome of that. Um, things are moving on a pace. People are genuinely engaging with us, which is really, really good. We have a, an online survey that is there as well for people to engage with. Um, I'm going to pass over to Christy to talk through where we've got with everything. Thanks, Christy. Apologies, my microphone wasn't working. Um, yes, thank you, Councillor Dean. Um, yeah, as, uh, as she said, we've, we've moved on quite a lot from the uh, report that's before you, because uh, obviously the consultation is still ongoing until the end of August. Um, myself and a team of casual staff from the assembly rooms have been undertaking the public consultation events over the last week and a half. Uh, and in that time, we've met over 200 people uh, and giving out uh, hard copies of the survey as well as engaged them in conversations and further discussions. Uh, we've also been offering colouring sheets as well to uh, school aged children uh, for them to reflect back visually uh, what their aspirations for their future Tamworth are going to be as well to complement uh, the work that we've done so far. Um, last week we've done sessions at the heart of Tamworth in Glasgow, Helping Hands, CIC and the Castle Pleasure Grounds, as well as today a very busy uh, market day uh, in town um, where we've given out over 100 um, forms in, in and of itself today. Um, so that's been uh, really, really well regarded. The um, and welcomed by people who've attended those sessions. Um, following requests from members as well, we've also included some additional sessions on Thursday, and we're uh, just in the, in the process of organising one as well for Saturday Anchor side. Um, so the one at Thursday will be here, um, where we'll be engaging into the evening to catch those who, who perhaps can't make it during the daytime due to work commitments. We will also be working with the active uh, communities team on the 27th of August, because they're doing a massive engagement day uh, with the, with the public of Tamworth, so we'll be uh, supporting them as well and, and offering a presence for people to feed in during that process. Um, there are still sessions that were that, that were outlined in the plan for Commonwealth Hub and Asset uh, Ventura, um, and we're getting lots of positive engagement and lots of suggestions and ideas from, from residents and visitors, as well as uh, businesses within the town. The survey uh, it, online will remain open till midnight on the 26th of August um, and hard copies are also available in the assembly rooms uh, and we've been delivering them and engaging with charity groups and, and organisations to make sure that they've got access to those hard copies as well and collecting them at a regular basis. Um, we're hoping to have the draft summary of results available in early September um, and then obviously we'll update uh, and provide a final draft of the, uh, the, the plan uh, which will then go forward as part of the process uh, to prepare the budget for next February. Um, there's still some engagement with key stakeholders that's ongoing, DWP, NHS and some of the registered social landlords due to their holiday uh, commitments and the capacity um, that, that I've got to actually engage with them. So uh, most of those are, are taking place again within the next two weeks. Um, I've also had invites for September to some of the key consultation exercises which are going ahead uh, with uh, Support Staffordshire, the Community Safety Partnership, the Chamber of Commerce and the Town Centre Forum, which is uh, recently started meeting. Uh, I've also been asked to the TCG in early December, uh, to, uh, November, sorry, to, uh, to present um, where we are with the corporate plan and engage them uh, specifically on, on, on uh, getting their thoughts uh, included in the priorities. 
Um, we're also working with the comms team on the annual survey, which will go out in the autumn as normal, that will support that budget consultation process that will come forward through scrutiny uh, later on in the year and into the early new year as part of the uh, joint scrutiny as well that we have for, uh, for the budget process. And um, we're also doing uh, sessions on a regular basis with staff. Uh, the engagement with them has been very high, and obviously we're talking not just about the priorities, but the underpinning values that we hold as the council uh, with the new leadership and the new chief executive, uh, as well as the uh, the corporate plan uh, re refresh that we're doing. Um, and uh, thankfully, we've done a, a, a workshop for members as well, uh, which has had a really good take up. And I think there's just a handful now uh, that I'm targeting with one-to-one -one discussions to try and make sure that everybody's got their input into uh, into the plan. Um, lastly, the, the, the sort of the, the, the key themes of the theme, uh, the, the feedback that people are giving us is around those uh, topics of social housing availability and accessibility, particularly for young people within the borough. Um, still lots of discussions about visibility of policing um, and uh, potholes and road congestion issues. So uh, we're getting the old chestnuts that aren't necessarily directly in our control, but the expectation from our residents uh, that we will work with those partners to try and tackle some of those concerns that they have. Um, the accessibility and vibrancy of the town centre, um, uh, obviously a lot of the, the consultations taking place there and that's very visible and a point of discussion for lots of people, particularly around the conflicts in the pedestrianised areas um, and the redevelopment and what that's done to the space. Um, Obviously, it's been discussed briefly this evening, the accessibility of the council and the ability for people to uh, come in and talk to somebody and have their, uh, their whatever their issues is either dealt with or signposted to the correct authority in the right way are also coming through as very strong themes uh, that will be reflected in the final report. But happy to take any other questions, suggestions uh, or any other ideas that members may have to further that engagement. Thanks for, report, uh, thanks for that report and uh, for going through that. Uh, I just got some quick questions and probably quick answers just to clarify. Um, so in the last corporate scrutiny me uh, meeting, um, it was mentioned um, that going to cabinet would include a fully developed uh, consultation plan, which includes everyone that we're going to see over the next six weeks. Um, just to confirm, what is this plan? What was this plan? Um, because at the cabinet, it was the timeline. So I just want some clarification. Yes, so obviously the outline timeline, uh, because it was holiday season, it hasn't been possible to confirm everybody that we're going out to and the discussions, and we, we're still in discovery phase. So there are still groups that we're finding. Even today, I've had two new groups that have been referred to me, uh, which I will be engaging with over the next couple of days uh, to try and get appointments with and, and to provide them with the copies and get the feedback. Um, so yeah, we, we, we started with a, a fairly comprehensive list, but it's still growing um, because Obviously, there isn't a single source of, uh, of this within the council at the moment, uh, or if there isn't, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> yeah, I just, um, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be ruthless here, but I just want uh, to mention that I would hope to see a little bit more consistency in some of the areas of what we're talking about, and I'll just give an example. Um, so, when we were talking about the consultation plan, um, that. Uh, went to cabinet and the cabinet report was called the corporate plan uh, sorry corporate plan and then development timeline that was the title of the report and then we have the purpose indicating it being called the program of consultation to finalize so it's now the consult it's gone from timeline to consultation um, then we got the recommendation where it says cabinet approved the proposed timeline so we now got timeline and then we've got uh, further onto the report um, time frame. So the report out outlines the suggested time frame. Um, and then you've got the appendices. So that's the attachment within the report. It says draft consultation plan. And then when you, we look at the appendices or the appendix one as it was at the time, it says draft corporate plan timeline. So we've got lots of different wordings for what I believe is the same thing. So I would just, m my suggestion I suppose would just to make it easier to go through and to read, you know, just have a bit more consistency. Yeah, I can't say I disagree with that, but people know what they're talking about. 
Um, I was just going to ask as well, um, we, we had a workshop meeting uh, on this, which obviously I attended, but the workshop I noticed wasn't on the original timeline or time frame. You know, was that put in afterwards? Uh, the intention was that there would always be a workshop, but the dates just hadn't been confirmed. It's been, uh, yeah, just a case of getting things organised and in the time that's available. Um, so, yes, we did a workshop uh, last week, and uh, two weeks ago, sorry, and we done, uh, uh, did another one uh, today to, to catch up, and anybody who hasn't had the opportunity to see that uh, will be uh, invited to a one-to-one -one in the next week or so. Again, just some further quick questions and um, I'm sure quick answers um, before I bring in other people. So I think Councillor Wells actually mentioned on the last meeting um, a possible but, uh, 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 in, in, in terms of engagement with residents. And I believe it was suggested that we'd be hope, hoping for about 700 general responses from residents. Um, I've noted in the appendices we haven't, from what I can see from general residents, we haven't seen anything yet. Have we got anything from residents uh, that can, we can see? Um, I've got over 100 uh, hard copy that have been handed in um, during the events that I've been discussing. I've also got uh, narrative statements from around 30, uh, 30 people where we've, we've done sort of one-to-one -one discussions uh, around the topics that have been there um, online. Um, last week, I know that there'd been about 100 that had, that had gone through, uh, so I would expect that that will have probably doubled by now. So we're, we're on track uh, for that, and certainly with the engagement that we're, we're planning and the engagement day, I think we will, will be fairly close. I think the difference is that we, we have um, specifically targeted groups, so a lot of the group work is happening uh, now and the next week, um, where we're, we're actually um, targeting hard to reach groups that we've perhaps not engaged with previously. Uh, Councillor Jay. Um, yeah, not much to say on the report for now. We'll see what you know emerges later on, but thanks for the update. Just one genuine question, I'll be a little bit facetious. You mentioned children's colouring as you've been, I'm hoping you're not putting much weight on that to, to, to set the vision. If I can, we have we have broken down and and, and put some uh, some themes together around the the five topics to try and give children an opportunity to express what they would like to see in their future Tamworth. Um, and actually today, that's been really well received by families, uh, particularly if mum and dad are standing around and discussing things with us for five minutes. The kids engaging with that and 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 giving us, you know, it's not all uh, helter skelters and and uh, Tamworth eyes. Um, you know, they have come up with things that they want to see for themselves. Uh, particularly thinking about those that, that are able to express what they would like to see when they're grown up uh, and they they have perhaps their own family uh, in Tamworth. Uh, and I think that's that's really the aspiration that we're looking for from, from this stage of the development of the plan is that, you know, what's the blue sky thinking? Uh, and they can definitely draw those. Forward to the unicorn train around the train, town centre then or something that comes out. Councillor Wells. Just a couple of thoughts I can throw in, if that's OK. Um, I've, had, I've actually had a look at some other corporate plans from other, um, other councils. And uh, I think the first point I would say is I know at the moment what you've shown us already, Crystal, has been effectively listing out, if you like, high level aspirations, etc. I would impress that I think it's really important that what comes out of the plan um, <clears throat> is some concrete deliverables. So we know when we've done it. Um, I know that a lot of the aspirations are phrased in the present tense, like we are this, that, and the other. Well, if we are this, let's go and do something else. Um, so it's just little things like that. But sorry, I'll just leave you with one final thing. I think that that they're, they're linked around a number of themes. We've got place settings and we've got environment. We've got all of those, which I think is a great way of drawing attention to those key themes. I think another theme may have evolved emerged in, in the recent weeks that I would urge you to think about. And I refer to the recent unrest that we've had in Tamworth. Um, and I, I'd quite like to th us to think about a set of direct actions with the aim of bringing people together with a sense of pride. And my thoughts actually turn to things like, I mean, I'll throw some ideas in for, a, for a sort of starters for 10. I, I know of similar 
very deprived areas in Scotland, for example, have turned to things like promoting musical groups where the togetherness of a shared identity and a common purpose have helped bring people together, practicing music instruments, working together, etc. But I also think it could link with some of the other themes in uh, already identified, um, many of the environmental themes, for example, and I would refer to <coughs> perhaps a, a less popular figure these days, uh, Mayor Giuliani's classic uh, broken window effect of trying to develop uh, a sense of that sense of community and pride. So I, I just urge you, please, if we could potentially develop some themes around that to show that we are responding to clearly a time which I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced is going away at this point in time, but I don't want to bring big P politics into it. I just think there's a need. Before that's answered, can I just step in and just quickly talk about the time? So the time is uh, approaching half eight, and under the current rules, um, we must only go to half eight unless we have a vote. Um, I actually think um, the debate tonight, particularly around the leaseholders, was, was massively uh, useful and rewarding, as uh, Councillor Dean alluded to earlier. So obviously that did go on probably more than what would be a typical agenda item. Um, I would suggest, um, I would hope that uh, we would have your agreement to um, uh, extend this by next half an hour. I'm looking at nine o'clock. Uh, we've got the rest of this in terms of the corporate plan. We've also got the um, stuff that's outside of the, um, the, the public, um, uh, excluded from the present public item, as you can see on the agenda item. Um, does anybody want to, did you want to comment on that, Councillor Price? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would like to comment on it. Um, uh, whilst I, I'm not opposed to, to voting for the extra time, um, I would like to say um, that I'm a little disappointed at just how uh, stacked the agenda is with five what I would consider quite important items that all deserve equal amounts of, of our time to scrutinise. Um, and I think we're doing certain items a disservice by only being able to scrutinise them till nine o'clock. So whilst I'm not opposed to voting for the additional time, I would like us to think in future about how much we stack our agendas because looking down the work plan, which I was going to come onto later, um, we've got two items um, that aren't quarterly performance reports in our work plan for the future. And I'm sure some of these items that are on the agenda this evening um, aren't date critical and could have gone onto them agendas. So. Yeah, noted. I, I actually, I, I'm, I'm happy to go on further past nine, but I understand obviously we're uh, absolutely, yeah. No, I just made the point um, that uh, I'm, 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 I'm willing to do that, just so you know, from my vantage point. Um, I believe the vote would be a, a, an addition of a, uh, half an hour only, which is also why I mentioned the nine o'clock as well. Um, so, yeah, point taken on that. Um, at the mo it's, it's a tricky one because, of, you know, I, I've seen scrutiny meetings before only last sort of 45 minutes or less. So I was keen to sort of try and get... Um, more on the agenda, should we say? Um, but you know, I take I take your point. Um, one thing I would say is um, we can also we can always bring anything back to the next committee or the one afterwards. Um, so we can do that. And of course, the corporate plan. I'm sure um, that discussion around that can be taken uh, offline as well with the relevant officers. And of course, you've got the workshops as well. Um, so th there's room for that. Um, did somebody else want to comment? Yeah, Councillor Jay. Is the excluded item um, important today? Time sensitive. Time sensitive. Uh, well, I, it was added because um, you you, re you mentioned it at the end of the last meeting, and so I wanted to, uh, of course, uh, fulfil uh, your request on that. And I think it is useful, but it can be done on the next meeting. Yes. When is the next? Uh, in three weeks, is it? It's only three weeks away. Fifth of September, I believe. I would say put it on the next one and don't extend. Just wrap up because. You know, that, yes, it's, it's important to get up down the two items, but they're going to be excluded. But for the sake of, you know, it's two weeks away. I, I agree with that. Um, I don't see any reason for that. Does anybody have any objections with that in moving it to the next one? Is that okay? We can. I mean, that's the officers. Is, are the officers okay with that as a general? Yeah, okay. okay. So. Okay, do we still need to vote? Because this corporate plan is going to go beyond 8.30, I should imagine. If, if, if it gets to 8.30 and we have an extended, it's just moved. We can just... 
No, so, we, so are we happy to extend uh, just so we can get the corporate uh, plan in? Because I should imagine at this particular point we might be looking at about, I don't know, quarter to nine, I should imagine, for the rest of the corporate plan agenda item. I'm happy to move it, yes. Second. So that's nine, yeah. Well, Excuse me, yeah. I think you're right, Councillor Jay. You're referring to the item 15, which I think is a fairly weighty piece of discussion. Is that, is that right? 14 and 15. Fine, fine. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'd, I'd say we just finish off there. Yeah, done with that. Okay, is everyone okay with that to, uh, to vote for that? Yeah, all happy. We're voting specifically 9.1.13 that the meeting continues beyond 8.30 for an additional half an hour. That's just to do the corporate plan. That's just to get the corporate plan. And, and then we'll adjourn the, uh, the, the uh, sensitive items. <laughs> okay, let's just say, yeah. in terms of, we need to decide if we're extending the meeting. That, that's the first thing we need to decide if we're extending. Chair, can I propose we yeah. extend it for 15 minutes after 8.30? and get on with it instead of having lots of talking about that's what i'm trying to do yeah so <laughs> okay uh, i'm proposing that, that and yeah yeah okay can we all, all in favor thank you right let's let's carry on and chair can i propose that we defer the last two items of confidential yeah. to the next meeting yeah we agree to second yeah <laughs> that was Yeah, on the on the deferring of the um, uh, sensitive items with that, the excludive items, we had a move on Councillor Summers and second on Councillor Jay on deferring those items. So, yep, yeah, okay. So let's carry on. Uh, any more questions on the corporate plan? Does somebody have their hands up, Councillor Price. Yeah, um, I just um, I wanted to. I suppose it's a bit of a comment but with a, maybe a question at the end. But um, so obviously we've been talking about um, comms around this, uh, the corporate plan, um, and engagement. Um, and I think the the engagement that you've that you've listed uh, sounds great, really good. Um, I sometimes go onto social media, and there are various groups in Tamworth. Um, of, uh, which are, uh, are run by residents and they've got varying opinions of us as, a, as an authority uh, and how we decide to communicate with our um, our residents. Uh, there's one in particular, which I, which I won't name, um, who um, believes that um, Tamworth Borough Council needs to wake up and smell the electoral coffee or something like that. Um, and it's basically with, with regards to us using Facebook and Facebook polls um, for engagement purposes. Um, now, I don't know if that is a possibility. I don't know if that's something that we've looked at as an authority, but it is something that's brought up quite often by this particular member of this particular group. So the question that I would ask around that is um, being a new open um, authority that we are, um, is this something that we could look into? Um, is it possible to use Facebook as an engagement tool for polls? Um, what would be the benefit to us as an authority in using Facebook in that way? Would it give us uh, better insight into the engagement? Would it give us uh, better options for uh, the way that we gather that information, how we can display that information, how quickly we can get that information, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and would there be a, a benefit potentially in how many people engage with us? Um, so um, I think there's a question in there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're, we're more than open to looking at it and under, understanding what it is. I've never used them myself, but I'm sure there are people and we can quickly yeah. find a way of doing it. I, I also don't really understand it, um, but I, like I say, there is a certain person that, that suggests that we should be using this. Uh, one of my colleagues to, to the right, I'm pretty sure, has an idea how to do it and is probably about to say something, maybe. You, you're pretty up on social media now. Am I? Well, I think Councillor Dean wanted to come back on that one. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. I think that's a conversation we need to have with the comms team because they will have the insight as to whether these things work, I would hope, because they're using them all the time. It, 
I don't understand it either. I, I would love to say it was my suggestion, but I've, I've asked this on behalf of a resident that's brought it up, so, uh, so the thanks should go to them. And that's part of the consultation, isn't it? Getting from residents how they think we should better engage with them. So definitely something we should look at. Uh, Councillor Summers, and we've got Councillor Wells. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. I don't think it hurts to use, would use, uh, hurt to use Facebook. But I mean, at the end of the day, um, a lot of people are very wrapped up in that platform and they're online already. It's not the greatest of steps to, you know, click a link and go to a survey that we've set up to, to go and have your say and engage with us. But because it's not on Facebook, that's apparently impossible for some people. That doesn't make sense. Um, it, you know, Facebook's not a walled garden. You can easily leave it. You can go to other web pages. It's not hard. Um, you know, and, and if people really want to engage with us, they can. It's just a little bit more effort. It's, it, it doesn't make sense why you, you would... Um, why we would see it's it, it's an, a massive advantage to go onto Facebook, I suppose, in terms of analytics of who's, you know, and targeting of people who you want to get um, information from, um, that would be useful. But you're on the internet. Facebook isn't the only thing that exists on it. You know, if you are desperate to have a say and engage with the town and the council, go to the website to do it. It really isn't hard, is what I'd say to that resident. Um, yeah, okay, Councillor Wells. No, it was really just to say that, funnily enough, communication seems to be quite a big theme running through this meeting this evening. Um, and I, I would just say that uh, in the light of uh, any discussions on Facebook, um, what, what did you call it? What was it, the thing? Polls, thank you. Uh, can we get? Can we just tell this? Can we just square the circle? So, whatever we decide, we tell the guy we are or we aren't because of. You know, it's a, communication is a is a sort of a round thing, really. Councillor Cashman. With re with reference to this particular person, um, I did send him the link. Um, oh, really? And then he ranted and raved, and then I said, well, what do you want? And then I got a load of incoherent stuff, so I didn't bother anymore. Councillor Price. Can I just clarify, I'm, I'm, I have not been in contact with this person. I just happened to read the post, um, and I'm in no way uh, saying that this is the way forward or it's not the way forward, but I, I, I see this a lot where people ask these questions and say, why don't we do it? Um, and, and like I say, I don't know if there is a reason why we don't do it. Uh, there, there, there may be. I don't know. Um, so I thought it was it was worth asking the question in the forum, um, so because because I do feel like the the person may be watching this feed, um, and, and <laughs> will will get an answer. And and, and again, it, it's nothing. I'm I'm not picking on this particular person, but it, but it, but it's the. I think I think the point is that there are these um, there are these pages out there where residents in Tamworth, whilst they don't directly engage with us as an authority, um, the, the, there are comments that are made about what we do as an authority, and the, there is no harm in that information being gathered and used in in these kind of things it, when when we talk about how do we communicate with residents, um, you know. Because, like mine said, yes, Facebook is, is one element of it, but there are other social media platforms, and, and we do live in a social age. Um, and, and, and some people do think that, that, as an authority, we are a bit behind when it, when it comes to that. Um, again, th these are not my opinions. These are just, you know. So, yeah, that's, that's all I'd say on that. Dean. And we did some social media training with um, Tanya, who heads the comms team, and she talked about all the different platforms that the comms team use. So there is potential there. It's just a case of finding out which are the best ones for this, because it is all about that insight of what works best and what you're going to get back from it. But it's there. Maybe we should be using it in different ways. 
Any more questions or comments? Okay, uh, the recommendation was what we've essentially done. Um, we've already talked about it. Um, so if that's okay, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to move on. Um, so thank you for the report and the update. Uh, and um, I would say that at this point, obviously we'll talk about the work plan, but um, I would hope to bring it back at some point. We'll have to just uh, figure out when um, because obviously we need to continue the feedback and the review of this plan. Okay, um, if you wish to leave, um, officers, you are welcome to do so. Thank you for um, slightly extended appearance tonight, um, as it currently is. So moving on to the next one, which we have is the, uh, there's no working group, of course, which was agenda item 10. Um, Item 11, forward plan. Is there anybody, I would suggest, by the way, if anybody is looking at the forward plan, to add to email me and let me know if they have anything on that. Um, if that's okay, I'll move on to the uh, 12, agenda 12, corporate scrutiny, work plan and action log. Uh, now, just so you're aware, um, we have the ICT, which I alluded to in the last meeting. I was, um, uh, we actually, uh, it was going to be on this meeting, but obviously we realised it was quite bulky. <laughs> Trying to do everything at once. Um, so it will be on the next one. And um, there's obviously a lot to talk about that, so we'll have plenty of time. I believe they'll only end up being two agenda items, but they're obviously ones that are vitally important. The other one is to do, which again we mentioned earlier, which is to do with the... Um, uh, where we do the uh, where we do these meetings, basically, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, at the front desk and the committee meetings. Yeah. So we we're going to talk about the front desk and the committee meetings. So it's two of those in in one sort of agenda item. Um, so is there anything else that anybody wanted to mention in terms of the the work plan going forward? Um, as I said to you, um, in Prior to this particular committee and following the last one, I was hoping to have a slight amount more engagement maybe offline in terms of kind of talking about this. So apologies that wasn't the case. We were entering the summer holidays and there was, there was quite a lot going on. But I do want to have more of a reciprocal dialogue in terms of what we are putting on and, uh, and uh, you know, properly sort of going through it, should we say. So yeah, if, if everyone's okay, we'll close the meeting at 8.36 p.m. Thank you all.